is your guy? And I was, I was like, absolutely it is. You know, it worked. I said, uh, all right, this is what we're going to do. They're going to hit it. He's going to hit a ground ball. We're going to turn double play, and we're going to get out of this inning. Double play ball. There's one. Got to hurry. Got him. What a way for Sonny Gray to debut in St. Louis. He's through five with the lead. One nothing here at Bush Stadium. Alongside Alex and T-Bone on BK, you got BK and Ferrario here on 101 ESPN. That's what it sounded like last night on Valley Sports Midwest as the Cardinals get a much-needed victory against the Phillies. Alex, they played about as well as you could possibly ask for. I understand the offense was not overwhelming, but you were going up against arguably the best currently healthy pitcher in Major League Baseball in Zach Wheeler. And you did enough. You did enough to give yourself a chance to win. You have a fantastic outing by Sonny Gray last night. We'll get to that here in just a minute. And I thought the manager did a hell of a job. Let's give a round of applause to Ollie Marmel. No. Who I thought did great All last right, night. Clint, and I'm dude. being genuine. Oh, like, look, he's I wearing he his Ollie shirt. He played that with the pin. The way that we saw him manipulate things in 2022. I thought 22, he was amazing. Uh, operating with the bullpen. And I think last year it was up and down. It was topsy-turvy. I think some of that, though, was a result of him not having the dudes back there to be able to turn to. Good decisions can get some terrible results when you don't have the right guys that are coming out of your bullpen. And I think this year, he's got the right dudes, man. Part of that is Matthew Liberatore, who hot damn, had nothing last night. Zero stuff, velocity down, command not there, finds a way to grind through, though. And when he gets through three batters, immediately all he's like, got to get him out of here. He clearly doesn't have his best stuff. Let's get Kittridge into the game. So he goes to Kittridge. He gets out of that inning with a strikeout, stranding Schwarber at third base. Huge out by Andrew Kittridge. That's a dude I'm not sure they have on the roster a year ago for that exact spot. Then comes out the next inning, mm, up and down a bit. JoJo Romero, come on, let's do this, buddy. He gets three batters. He faces Marsh, Rojas, Schwarber. That stretch of batters where you got a couple of big-time lefties in there. Inherits two on, one out. Walks Marsh. Uh-oh, not good. Then back-to-back -back strikeouts to get out of the inning. Again, not sure they have Kittridge in that spot a year ago. They don't have a dude that can get out of that spot the way that he did. Then Romero goes to the eighth inning and faces Turner, Harper, Stubbs, and Bohm. He has Palante available if he needs him. You don't want to go to Andre Palante, though, against those right-handed hitters. And Ollie sticks with JoJo Romero there, man. Despite having more than 30 pitches thrown, he's like, you know what? We're sticking with him for Bohm. I think this is our best spot. And credit to him, he was exactly right. He gets out of it. You find a way to get out of that inning. Huge gumption by JoJo Romero. That showed you a little something. JoJo can be in our circle of trust for the long haul now. Sweet. Then you go to Ryan Helsley for the ninth inning. Traditional closer, up three. Boom, let's get out of here. Let's get this game over with. And Helsley gets in, gets out, ready to go. I thought his bullpen usage last night could not have been any better, Alex. Great night for Ollie Marmel. Great night for the Cardinals. Back to 500. Feeling good going into the day game today, my friend. How you doing? I was most impressed by JoJo Romero for Absolutely. getting through that. That was the part for me that I was like, hot damn. I, I mean, to, to be called upon in that second go through in, in – to get all the way through those hitters. And with JoJo Romero, it, it feels like we're confident. But even we said at the beginning of the season, you're just uncertain when he takes the mound. But, man, JoJo Romero with electric stuff found ways to navigate through that and get the Cardinals to the desired position. He was the one that I was most impressed with. And then Ryan Helsley with the tradi traditional closer role. I, I guess if you knew... You didn't have to use Helsley in the traditional role. We probably would have saw Helsley a little bit there with JoJo Romero, but it's good for the Cardinals to have all of these guys right now to where, you know, it felt like there would be four. Giovanni Gallegos has made us a little uh, nervous, I guess what? I can say that, you when he takes them out. Takes but to know that you have three guys right now that when you call upon them, they are closing down the game. You're right. It's an area that the Cardinals did not have last year, and it was what we talked about in spring training, that their bullpen's their best stuff. Romero was the one for me. He was the hero last night. Oh, he was amazing. Yeah, he was awesome. And I think you're right, BK. Like, that was the perfectly managed game from Ali Marmol in terms of, all right, you knew you were going to be limited with Sonny Gray. You didn't know exactly what you're going to get out of him. He's able to kind of work his way through five innings. And once he worked through five innings, I was like, okay, the, really the fifth inning or the, excuse me, the sixth inning is the one of, okay, I don't know what you're going to do because I thought maybe Gio would be available. 
Um, but they go to Libertor. Libertor does his thing, and it just kind of pieces together. And you can see Ollie kind of playing with the puzzle pieces, trying to figure it out. And the fact that they can trust JoJo to eat potentially multiple innings. And look, that's not going to be the ideal scenario all season long. But Gio clearly down last night. If Gio's available, Gio's probably pitching Absolutely. the eighth inning or coming in at some point. And in you're that probably mix. losing that game. You use Whoa. JoJo for the lefties. You use uh, Gio for the righties, which yep. avoids what Alex is talking about there. It's the lefties that are crushing Gio over the last year or so. Like Marsh with the homer. That that's what's really hurting him right now so if you're able to avoid the lefties by going to jojo in that spot and he's got like a 295 ops against last year against left-handed pitchers jojo does that's a dude you want in those scenarios you've got it set up well but with you no longer being able to go last night's geo man you you got to find a way to get through and it's kind of it reminded me speaking of the phillies of that Phillies game in the playoffs where they're like one inning short with their relievers. We are like, yeah. okay, I get how you get from the sixth to the eighth, but I don't understand how you get the ninth as I'm working back here. I'm missing an inning. And in that game, it ended up costing them. In this game, last night, you had the right dudes available and you had a guy, to your point, Alex and JoJo, that went out there and said, what do you need? I've got whatever it is that you need tonight. And that's what you and didn't have last two. season. Maybe Hicks. Hicks was a guy that eventually emerged in that regard. But at this point last year, you're right. They didn't have anybody in that JoJo Romero role at yeah. this point last year. Nobody was going to Ollie before the game and saying, I got you for whatever it is that you yeah. need. And that is a hugely important role. Last night, it won them the game. It won you a game against a potential playoff threat in a, a game against Zach Wheeler where you only scored, scratched across three runs last night. That is a game they do not win last year. We've said that a number of times already this season, whether it's the comeback victories, the games where you're finding a way to hold a lead late because of the bullpen, the defense, the situational hitting. The Cardinals right now top three in Major League Baseball in productive outs on the year. They were bottom five in productive outs last season. It's just a different ball club, man. I'm not telling you they're going to be great. I don't think they're a great baseball team. I think they're pretty decent, though. I think they've got new and different ways to win for compared to a year ago. And I think the floor is much higher than it was last year because of the defense, because of the bullpen, because of the base running, because of the situational heading. I think since we're talking about dudes, I do want to give Ollie credit for what he did with Sonny Gray, too. Because walking up to Sonny Gray in that position and finding and Sonny telling him, like, I, I'm going to get this out. I'm going to get this double play. We're going to be fine. And Ollie leaving them in there because I'm sure a lot of people probably would have looked at that if it went the other way, saying Ollie should have pulled him. Of course, it goes well. And then people are complaining that Sonny didn't give him enough innings. I, I thought that was one of those moments that you also didn't have last season where the manager takes the mound. Manager listens to the player. The player says, I got this, and then backs up what he tells the manager. I think he's done that, though. I think that's one thing that he's been pretty consistent with is he'll he'll do the thing where he strolls over to the mound. He's like, hey, what do you got? He listens to the plan, and if he likes it, he sticks with him, and if he doesn't like it, he's like, yeah, quick hook. get out of here. <laughs> We're done. Well, that was you a cute go plan, back down to but you can go talk to Dusty about it. <laughs> so I, I do think that's something he's done before, but I will give him credit. He did it last night. And Sonny Gray, Ollie both spoke about that last night after the game on what the scenarios were. Here's what Ollie Marmel had to say about some of the scenarios that they were working through with Sonny Gray. Yeah, we went through a couple different scenarios if pitch count got high early, specifically the first inning, what that would look like and how we wanted to progress through that. And uh, we talked about what if he gives us five innings and keeps it under 65. And uh, he did exactly that. I loved what we saw out of Sonny Gray last night, man. I don't think that the Cardinals had any starter on their staff last year capable of doing what we saw last last night from Sonny Gray. Maybe Jordan Montgomery. Montgomery had some moments where it looked like that, and we saw it in the postseason, of course, uh, when he had some moments for Texas as well. But, man, that that's the kind of start that you get from a legitimate number one starter. Call him an ace. Call him a number two. Front, front end starting pitching. That is what Sonny Gray is. And you saw it last night against a really good lineup. The Phillies aren't hitting their stride right now, but that's a good lineup. That's going to do a lot of damage against a lot of teams. I looked this up last night. If you're just looking for when was the last time that the Phillies got shut out the way that they did against the Cardinals last night, the Phillies with Schwarber, Turner, Harper, Real Muto in the starting lineup, that group of four, which is like their core four position players. Didn't want to count Castellanos. It's just tough. I, I don't know that I can count him as one of the core position players, but... With those guys in the lineup, the last time that they were shut out was July 22nd of last year. It's been a long Dang. time since they've been shut out with those guys in the lineup. 
Um, the Phillies only shut out with that group of players four times in the lineup the entirety of last season. So a big time performance last night by Sonny Gray, by the Cardinals bullpen. What'd you see from Sonny, Alex? I, I loved it, man. You, you saw the the gamer that he was on the mound, even when his stuff wasn't there. We talked about how his location and his command wouldn't be the greatest right away. And it felt like even when it wasn't, he was still finding ways to get swing and miss. The swing and miss was the most impressive one to me for how he navigated through that, was able to get guys chasing with his movement. I, I just felt like the pitch limitation was the reason we saw five innings. If yeah. he didn't have a limit, we're talking seven innings for Sonny Gray, maybe eight. I mean, I felt like he had a gamer there, which is something that I haven't been able to say about this Cardinals team for the front end of their rotation since prime bueno. Yeah, I, they, they've clearly got the number one. And his stuff last night, like when, when he is ready to go at full force, yeah, he's going to be a legitimate stopper you know the, the thing the Cardinals haven't had for the last couple of seasons is not only have they not had the one but the important part of a number one in the regular season is he stops losing streaks and now with Sonny Gray when he is at full force and get to 100 pitches you're going to have a guy that's going to give you a fighting chance I mean he went toe-to-toe with Zach Wheeler last night and to Alex's point if he's at full go he probably goes at least six if not seven innings in that game the Cardinals have their number one and, and that's why we love the offseason signing yeah I just wish they had a number two yeah <laughs> I, I wish they got one more person to pair with him because when you see him and you see you watch that game and you see the defense you see uh, listen the the offense isn't what it's going to be it's you need more from Arenado you need more from Gorman you need more from it's not going to be 2004 offense I I think it's going to be better than what we've seen I'm going to power through here before we get to the end of this 2013 it's the best coming up next we know what Nolan Gorman is but does that mean that the Cardinals are lacking a number three hole hitter we'll talk about it next year on 101 ESPN Hey, it's BK. Have you been to one of those low testosterone places? You walk through the door and you say to yourself, man, I feel like I'm in some grungy, old, beaten down hospital. That is the opposite feeling that you get when you walk through the door at Victory Men's Health. They are here to unlock your inner champion. Go there today. They've got four great locations across the St. Louis area. O'Fallon, Missouri, O'Fallon, Illinois, Town and Country, Missouri, and their newest location just opened up about a month ago in Sunset Hills, Missouri. For the exact locations, check them out on victorymenshealth.com when you go over there you'll be able to see all of the different options that they have available to you whether it is low testosterone or if you just need to find out you're like thinking to yourself you know what i'm around the age of 40 i want to go over there get the micronutrient test find out exactly where i'm at they can do that for you at victory men's health again victorymenshealth.com is the place to go to be able to find out everything that they have to offer they will unlock your inner champion being a victory men's health.
<laughs> BK excited? wasn't in here yet. I was really excited for the lineup. <laughs> All right, it is time for the lineup game voice. here on BK <laughs> and or Tarzan. Ferrario. Or just scared the hell out of people driving in their car. All right, so we got a few <laughs> different things that are going to play into our lineup game today, Alex. One, look outside. Not sure there's going to be a game. Well, so you're probably not going to have... We always prepare for a game. Nolan Arenado, for example, in the lineup, he because I would assume... Can't play in the rain? Eventually, he's going to get a day off. Again, I'm going to power through here. Um, other than that, you've got some guys that are struggling. Jordan Walker had a day off yesterday because of some of his struggles. Eventually, you're probably going to get, I would imagine, a day off for Victor Scott. So keep that all in mind, Alex, as we're going through this lineup today. You ready? Yeah, this is going to be abysmal. All right. Also, we should probably plan on Brandon Crawford, so I want to see BK get angry. <laughs> no, I won't get angry. Nation today. Winpin's great. All right, let's do it. I think off the top, it's obvious. Brendan Donovan doesn't get days off because he is the guy that gets to start in place of the guys that get the days off. Yeah, sorry, Brendan. You're not allowed to have any rest days while everyone else does. I'm with you. He's I have starting. no idea what position he's playing. All right. Way to go, Donnie. My one guess one. is third base. Do you think Goldie is playing today, Alex? He has not had a day off yeah, yet. No, I think he's off. I I don't know who's playing first. I guess you're Burleson. You're, yeah, but I don't think Burleson's Burleson. hitting second. I agreed, but I think Burleson would be the guy that is playing yeah. at first today. So if Goldie's not hitting at all. Yeah, he's not in the lineup. So I would assume your two-hole hitter then becomes... It would be a righty, and if we're thinking Arenado's off, is it Walker? Contreras? Him, yeah, Contreras would make sense. That would I mean, unless you're going to go Walker here, Contreras would be the and way I would go. And Walker way down in the lineup. Yeah, well, and especially struggling off day. I don't think you're putting him into a... I'd say let's go Wilson. Let's go Wilson Contreras here. Wilson! 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 So as Ollie likes to formulate, it's I'm lefty. Guessing he's not catching today. Yeah, no, I think he's Although your DH. Although day game after a night game, he uh, hit yesterday. I think his hand still he couldn't close the catcher's up. Yeah. yesterday. I think you're putting her. You're not taking Herrera out either. So I, I think you're going to keep Contreras there. Three hole hitter, lefty Gorman. Gorman. Stormin Gorman, he's taking the league by storm. So we're assuming Is Arenado's Arenado off. Way? No, I think he's off too. If Goldie's off, Arenado's off. Okay. Your right? cleanup hitter, Alec Burleson? Go two lefties? I don't know who else you go to here. You go Herrera here, wouldn't you? Oh, there you go. Yeah, Herrera. Herrera? Yeah, Herrera. What a shame. Okay. So Arenado is playing? Mm. I, I would go Burleson here. Okay. Go for it. You are so wrong. So it's Arenado. Nolan is a security guard at the lumber yard. I respect it, Nolan. He says, I know I'm bad right now, but I'm going to keep grinding. I'm guessing what he's telling them is I need at bats to be able to get through this. I need to keep pushing. We know this is how he operates. So I, hmm? hey man, if that's what Can't the player's telling you, what are you going to do? I, I think he needs a day off. I think he needs a total mental reset. He looks lost. No, go, no. The right only guys now, that we give but, days off yeah. to are the ones that are hitting well, like Mason Wynn. <laughs> Right. Since he's in, not, now I would go Burleson. Now it's Burleson. You're going lefty. No, no, no. Okay. So this one would be Yvonne Herrera. You're going two righties and then a lefty. I would go Yvonne Herrera here. Okay. I'm just going to say this right now. I think Yvonne Herrera is going to hit a home run right here. Oh. Marsh just <laughs> literally called that at Ballpark Marsh, Village. Yeah, I still love Marshy's cackle, knowing that he got that one right. Should I guess Burleson again? I'm just I mean, we're three for three, guessing. so sound like the fast lane right now. Yeah, we'll go Burleson here. You got to put, he's not going three righties in a row. Oh, Burley, you're so rugged and manly. Right, now's where we get to the fun part. Now, the, now we're doing the nitty gritty. <laughs> Hit the gritty? You're not going to like this one. I think this is Brandon Crawford. <laughs> well, lefty, lefty? There's not a lefty on the mound today, guys. There's this guy named Aaron Nola that I, right I, No, I'm talking about going left-handed uh -oh. and then left-handed. I think, I think Walker's going to be hitting eighth or ninth. Although not ninth. That'll be Victor Scott. I think, you, I think Walker's I'll hitting I'll go eighth. with you. I think it's Jordan Walker, but we'll go Brandon Crawford. So we'll... Oh, jumping crawdaddies. That, that totally screams Ali Marmol. Put Crawford here, and then Walker's going to hit in the eighth spot. 
because we're going to protect him because he's not doing well. I mean, he's really struggling, and you're going up against Aaron Nola, so whatever. Um, yeah, unless Aaron it's an Nola off day with again. Five ERA. Who uh, else is playing if it's an off? Oh, Siani. Yeah. Let's see Walker. Walk it like I talk it, talk it. Walk it like I talk it. Ay. Walk it like I talk it. Walk it, walk it like I talk it. Or Siani. I think Siani is next, actually. I think this is your day that you get Victor he's Scott. He's taking off. Victor Scott yeah. off. Ooh, I think Ollie's just going to be like, let's keep running it with Scott because he knows the end is near. <laughs> he knows that Memphis he's, still he's got Memphis like bound. Month, man. Nah, he's Memphis bound, baby. As soon as Lars is back. Who do you want to go with, Siani or Scott? I say Scott, but if you feel like it's Siani, go Siani. Uh, we went with you last time. You were right. We went with me at the time before that. We were wrong. I'll go Scott. Bang! He got it. Oh, okay. Victor. All right. All right, guys. Today's lineup. So is Donovan. Oh, Donovan's not third. So Donovan's left field. Brendan, Don, Brendan Donovan leading off in left. Wills Contreras second as the DH. Nolan Gorman third at second, followed by Nolan Arnato at third, batting fifth. Yvon Herrera, the catcher. Sixth, Alec Burleson at first. Seventh, Brandon Crawford at short. Eighth, Jordan Walker in right. Batting ninth, Victor Scott the second in center with Lance Lynn on the mound. First pitch, 12-15. Can't play Mason one without Paul Goldschmidt at first base. That makes sense. True. True. Not without that pick. Honestly, of I don't mind it for a getaway day, though. I don't want, mind it for a getaway day that's probably not going to be played. I don't mind it. I think I, I, I know Arenado needs probably to have the day off because he's struggling. But for a guy that's just going to keep going out there and try and figure it out, I appreciate it about him. I'm glad that they're keeping Yvonne Herrera in a clutch spot right there. The Walker one, I'd like to see him higher up, but. From the 314. Nolan just came off a nine game hitting streak, you buffoon. Why are you all on his ass? Seriously. Have you guys watched him? Yeah. Watch the baseball games. Yeah, I see him Whoa. get a hit every single game. Here we go. BK throwing out the yeah. watch the game Nolan Arnato has been the worst player on the Cardinals so far this year. I beg to differ. Victor it, Scott's hitting plate. below 100. Yeah. Victor Scott has scored six runs on the season. Is that right? Yes, yeah, six runs on the year. He's bat like 075. Nolan though. Arnato. Say, there's, no, there's no chance he scored six runs. Right? Nolan Arnato has four RBIs. Oh, well. Yeah, well it's just terrible. because if guys aren't on base in front Nolan of him. Nolan Arnato's runs plus RBIs, you get to the place where Victor Scott is as just pure run scored. So, yeah, um, I feel more than comfortable saying the worst guy at the plate, especially given expectations, has been Nolan Arenado so far this year. You're a buffoon, man. <laughs> Text line knows it. Yeah, the, the, I, I'm with BK. The, the Arenado struggles are the reason you're not seeing this team at its well, peak look right at that, Look at the moment he had to win the game. Yes, or two days or two games ago. And all of us had the same thought when he came up to the yeah. plate. Pinch this game's are over. Oh. <laughs> yeah, like, no one no. coming up in that spot. I would have been more comfortable with, like, six other dudes on the roster. I was Agreed. way more confident when Mason Wynn came up with the game on the line than I was with Nolan Arenado coming up with the game on the line. Agreed. That's not supposed to be how you feel right now. And that partially speaks to how great Mason Wynn has been and how confident he's been in those spots. And he didn't come through the other night. So, like, it's not a 100% hit rate, of course, but... The feeling when Nolan Arenado comes up to the plate right now is nothing good is going to come out of this. And that is very unfortunate. All right, Cardinals up later on this afternoon. They're going up against Aaron Nola. Got another front-end starter going up against this offense. We'll see how the Cardinals fare with that one. With Alex and T-Bone, I'm BK. Darren Pang, TV analyst for both the Blackhawks and Turner Spoitz. Spoitz? Spoitz, ladies and gentlemen, Spoitz. Panger next.
Terry Hendricks here with a Sports Center update driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. The Cardinals beat the Phillies yesterday 3 to nothing. They'll be back in action today. 12 15 will be first pitch. Aaron Nola on the mound for Philadelphia. Lance Lynn will get the start for the St. Louis Cardinals. Blues back in action tonight as well as they take on the Chicago Blackhawks. Well, a pregame coverage starting at 6 o'clock with Alex Ferrario and Joey Vitale. Then Joey will join Chris Gerber for puck drop at 7. Sports. This Sports Center update was driven by Johnny Londoff. Find your road shop 24 7 at Londoff.com. Londoffautoplex.com. Are you kidding me? Alongside Alex Ferrario, I'm Brandon Kiley. It's BK and Ferrario here on 101 ESPN, and we are always happy to go out to the 101 ESPN hotline when Darren Pang is on the line, TV analyst, of course, for the Chicago Blackhawks and for TNT, and you can hear him on the Back to You show with Catherine Tappen as well. Panger, we appreciate the time, man. How are you doing today? I am doing very well. Thank you. Great to be back here. And um, oh, I, I tell you, it's a, just the second time for me, and it's uh, it's still it's exciting to come back here. So I'm looking forward to tonight, and you know, seeing yourself and seeing everybody down there at uh, at, at the rink for the game tonight. Still bittersweet for you, Panger, when you walk through the doors at Enterprise. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, you know, I know I. No, there's nothing bitter about it. Uh, honestly, it's just it's great. It's sweet uh, more than bitter. How about that? I, I like uh, that one. You know, there's just just so many just so many good people and so many good friends and, and even last night uh you know i came here and i went to dinner at pastoria with my little with my daughter and her husband and my little granddaughters and then afterwards i, I met up with a couple of guys that i've known for a long time like tony sansone and and it's like it just it went yes actually i went yesterday afternoon too when we landed and i i went to siteman's uh uh siteman's like uh, uh cancer and i went and uh i met up with chaser oh so, nice I mean, you know so spent some time with with uh, chaser as well and Got to see his smiling face, and and uh, and so that so that's that's the great thing, and it'll always be that way. Panger, I'm surprised Chaser didn't try and pull you in to put the skates and the pads back on for that charity game. Yeah, he what a great job they did. Huh? Yeah, I mean, what a what a really a tremendous job to make. You know, that check was for six hundred thousand dollars, and they had a lot of other fundraisers following that. So I think that number is going to get higher than that. So that's that's Chaser all the way. I mean, yep. if he's going to do something, he just he does it right and. And, uh, and, he, and he, you know, he leans on friends and friends respond because he's treated people so well all his career, all his life. And, and now they come back and help out. So um, what, a, what a job he did. Penger, I didn't get the chance to, to talk to you after we found out about, about Chaser's diagnosis. But what was that response for you like? Because, of course, you have a, a very strong friendship with, with Chaser. Yeah, I'm, it's in, incredibly difficult to hear him, you know, say the words, to be honest with you. I, was, I remember I was walking in, at Fulton Market. Uh, with my wife it was a you know it was a beautiful sunny day and we're going for a walk and you know i remember uh remember lynn saying to me like you okay and i'm like no not really <laughs> you know i mean it's chaser big strong farm boy doesn't get sick you know i mean i had him on the road i i, I said that to him i said i i had you on the road um, I dragged you to places at all hours of the night, or he dragged me to places at all <laughs> hours of the night. There's no way this guy is, has got cancer. There's no chance. And, uh, but, you know, then you, when you hear his voice and, and he wants to calm you down, basically, um, <laughs> then, then you know everything's going to be okay. So, yeah. um, but seeing him yesterday, you know, it, it was, uh, he posted a picture on Twitter. He's, he's got these great sayings on, on the wall at the hospital, and he's, he's a highly motivated person. I think he, he should give a lot of people strength. Uh, I travel with, uh, former Hawk Troy Murray, he does the radio for us, and and uh, and and he's got stage four cancer, and I'm I'm with him every day, and I I see a guy that never complains, you know, never when everybody else is moaning about something, there's a guy with cancer who doesn't complain, doesn't say a word to anybody. So I think the I think guys like that and Chaser, or Tony Granado was there. I mean, just totally inspiring people, and I think that should give uh, you know people that don't have what we have, which is a stage or you know a platform because of our past history or being an athlete but you know for, for the people out there that are, are suffering from it i hope that they look at these guys and say you know what tomorrow's going to be a better day or i can put a smile on my face and do something different you know hanger part of what what makes that community so special here in st louis especially in terms of the hockey community the the former blues alumni is that the, the guys that wore the note on their chest, they, they, mm -hmm. they remember it so fondly. And there's a culture that comes with that. 
and that's been the conversation as you're certainly aware panger here in st louis over the past few seasons is like is that going away or are, are we still having that when, when you look at the team and you're seeing it from afar now certainly more than when you were with them on a day-to-day -day basis a guy like Jake Neighbors feels like he brings some of that back to the table. And I, I don't know what his status is going to be over the next week or so as we finish out the season. But he's been spectacular so far uh, for St. Louis this year. What's been your impression of watching him from afar? Oh, it's been fantastic. From the moment I met Jake, I, I was thoroughly impressed. Um, and even at that time, not knowing what kind of player he would be, would he be an NHL player? Did he have the foot speed to be an NHL player? Um, you know, that was still uncertain, a late first round pick, but you know, the more you saw him and the more you saw him soak up the information, you know, from a Braden Shen, um, from a, like Justin Falk and these guys, they, you could tell that he just, he, you know, some guys just get it and some guys don't get it and some guys will never get it. And, and then other guys like him, it just, you know, he, he, he's the next generation of of the players that we talked about. It, it does start with the alumni of the St. Louis Blues. The alumni is incredible um it goes from bruce affleck to you know to to bernie uh you go all the way down the line but then you then you know then chaser heavily involved and chaser doesn't take no for an answer and i, I think that's what you've got i think that's what you got to do to, to continue to have culture is to make sure you keep bringing in guys like that that uh that it it, it absolutely bleeds through the sweater that these are the guys that you want to go to war with these are the guys that are going to go into you know, the city of St. Louis, and they're going to endear themselves to the fans, and they're going to be there forever. They're going to go into OB Clark. They're going to meet people. They're going to, you know, they're going to, when the game's not great, they're going to find a way to change the culture of the game. And that's the guys that, that get St. Louis. And, and that's what I learned in my, in my 14 years of, of, of being part of the organization and seeing the alumni every single day. That's the impressive part. And the, the key is to get enough of those guys um, so that Blues fans absolutely adore you and want to go to the rink and they want to cheer for you uh, because they know you're giving it everything you've got. I feel bad for the guys that don't do that because you only have one opportunity to make a good impression. And <laughs> I think this is a very easy town, honestly, to make a good first impression. You just lay it on the line for everybody. Be genuine, play hard and, uh, and give it your soul. And, and I think they love you for that. Uh, Panger, so, Panger, I, I remember that opportunity. He, absolutely. And I remember us talking earlier in the season when the Blues and Blackhawks played against each other. And you had talked about, you know, you don't really know what's going on with this team, but you can only go back to the past and what worked. And you referenced the 2019 team and you said that team had the talent and just needed to check their egos at the door. And when they did, they went on that run. Yeah. Does this team feel like it's in that similar situation or do you feel like it's something different right now? Well, and the reason why I said that in 19 was because, you know, there were so many new players that were vitally important and had new personalities, you know, like, you know, certainly O'Reilly, but we brought back David Perron at that point. Patrick Maroon came in. Uh, Tyler Bozak, quiet, kind of unassuming, but, man, competitive. And, the co you know, coaches trust a guy like that to take key face off. So maybe he bumped somebody else off of that position. And, and I thought some guys were getting a little bit lost that were here previous. And because of the new players coming in, and, and that's when I said, right at ice level, and I remember looking over to my right, and I just blurted it out, until they check their egos at the door, they're not going anywhere fast. It's just, you can tell. And, and they did. And they found a role for everybody. And the coach uh, chief found a, a way to get everybody involved and didn't lose anybody on that bench. Is this team similar? Well, yeah, there are some players that, that uh, you know, probably, I would have to say when game, game's not going well, that they they likely think of, you know, of themselves or how they're not getting nice time. And then there's, you know, there's guys that, again, know how to drag you out of that funk and, 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 and make you better people and make you better players. And you know, all year long, I, I mean, I watch Braden Shen, and, and it's like it's like clockwork. The game's not going well. Um, need a spark. Who's there? It's number 10. I mean, who ended up getting in a fight the other day? Justin Falk. Yeah. You know, and, and no offense to Justin Falk, but somebody else should have probably, you know, got involved in that one there, you know, before the – Wiley veterans got to step in there, you know, um, and that's part of the learning process. I think that you're talking about with this team and not to check an ego at the door, but finding a way, you know, to make a bigger impact in the game other than, you know, handling pucks or getting some cookies or getting ozone face offs to really dig in. And I think, I think if, if you really dug in at certain points of the year, I mean, I think this blues team's a playoff team. And I think I said that earlier in the year, mm -hmm. I thought they'd be right there. 
Darren Pang is our guest for just another couple of minutes here on 101 ESPN. He is a TV analyst, of course, for the Blackhawks and on TNT. We love him here in St. Louis for all of his great work that he did with the Blues as well. Uh, Panger, when you think about the decision that the Blues are going to have to make as we get closer to this offseason uh, when it comes to the head coach, and Drew Bannister, I think, has done a really good job so far in the interim status. What do you think they should be? I'm not looking for necessarily a name, but the qualities that this team needs, given where it's at in its life cycle as an organization right now, what are some of the qualities that you think they need to be looking for in whoever it is that they bring in as their next head coach? Yeah, you're, and you're right. And, and you never know what Army's going to do. Um, uh, I mean, a lot of a lot of GMs have done the same thing and, and brought a coach in as a, an interim uh, head coach. And then, you know, the season ends and they look around and they – whether that maybe there's somebody out there that they thought they were going to get um well, next thing you know that coach doesn't get released from his job and now you know as you as you look at it and you analyze it and you then you go back to drew and you say you know what drew did a good job with this um he set a good tone here he made this player a healthy scratch uh he you know he, he did the, the he did what he what he could do uh with with what what he had on the roster in terms of playing guys or not playing guys. i don't know him that well um but I, I have to think. This is just me. But if I would have to think, and let's take let's take Doug Armstrong and the Blues right out of this equation. But let's let's think. Three weeks ago, how many coaches do you think that might have been available? And I think the number one guy that a lot of GMs were looking at saying, if they keep going this way, then maybe Mike Sullivan's available as an example. Mm-hmm. You know, now all of a sudden the Penguins are <laughs> like they're right there, and. Uh, and now, so maybe that coach isn't available. And then you look down the line and another coach is, is you think is going to be available and he's not available or maybe he cho- chooses another team. So I'm going in a roundabout way, but, but I, I, I know Army and the way that he, he does his due diligence and his work and the amount of phone calls he's probably making, you know, during the year, when the year ends, you know, looking ahead and looking to see if it Drew's the guy that he wants for the next, uh, for the next phase or somebody else that's available that maybe has a little bit more maybe history or experience or more presence behind the bench. Those are probably things that you look at as well. Panger, final one from me. And again, we, we truly appreciate the time and looking forward to seeing you tonight. You, you saw, you've seen this with the blues when you were here, you're living it right now with the Blackhawks. What's the difficulty for a team of trying to compete, but also grow the young players in the NHL? Yeah, that, that is not easy. And, uh, you know, obviously the, the blues are ahead of that game. Um, you know, with the quality of players that that, that are that are on the roster, uh, um, as compared, to, you know, the Hawks right now are it, it, it's very transparent, and it has been. Everybody knows what's going on, so I think that's that's the easy selling point, you know. And and you happen to get the first overall pick, and it's Connor Bedard, and now you're probably going to get a top three pick again to build off of that. But the the important thing is having guys like like Nick Foligno, um, Seth Jones is a good example. Jacob Magna and, and Tenorti uh, were brought in. Um, experience like that uh, to make sure that you surround Connor Bedard and a kid named Philip Kurashev and Lucas Reichel, you know, they're all, they're all younger players. And when things don't go well, you don't want those players to get down or find themselves in a dark hole. I mean, that's when you need the veteran players. Uh, you know, I mentioned Felino, you know, Peter Morazic got signed to an extension as well. Um, that's when you need those guys. I've seen it many times where Nick Foligno's, you know, grabbed Connor Bedard and put his arm over his shoulder and walked to the plane. And, you know, you can tell that, that, that those conversations are very meaningful in making sure that the kids see the, see the light at the end of the tunnel when it can be kind of depressing, I'm sure, at times losing so many games. He's Darren Pang. We always enjoy being able to catch up with him. You can find him on Twitter at Panger40. You can also hear him on the Back to You show with Catherine Tappen. Uh, it's a podcast that he's doing with Catherine Tappen. Be sure to check that out. Darren, thanks so much for the time, man. We appreciate it as always. We hope to talk with you again soon. That yeah, sounds great. Thanks for having me on, guys. See you to everybody here in the city. So thank you for doing this. See appreciate you, it. That's Darren Pang. Appreciate his time as always. Alex, your biggest takeaway. I think it's him talking about that 2019 team and then kind of going with this one. And and he even said like, yeah, look at 2019, it was a lot of new guys that you referenced had to um, check their egos at the door essentially. And he said, you could see some of that here. You don't have a lot of the newer guys, some of the guys you did, but he said, you can see that at times a team that, 
plays like a team, but then when things don't go well, they break apart into individuals, and that's where the game falls apart. I think you can reference both San Jose Sharks games that we've seen sure. recently to where the first period looks great. Second period is, well, that's not working. I'll do it myself, and then you fall away from it. But I also think what he said about Chen is absolutely spot on, and this is why – I know there were people and people still talking about Bennington throwing a haymaker in the middle of that game against the Ducks. You don't have enough guys that are willing to answer the bell right now. Like you've got guys that it feels like are too timid that don't want to take penalties and upset the coach or don't want to go out there and fight. You're going to have to have somebody that's willing to step in and step up. Like I think you've got a couple of veterans that do it, but every single night you can't be asking Braden Shen and Colton Pareko to be dropping the gloves. And right now, I don't think you could be asking Jake neighbors to do it. So you definitely need more grit on this team. And I think that's where uh, Panger was referencing with the squad. Yeah, that that's kind of where I would go. I think it's an and conversation. And sometimes we make it an or conversation of like, you need better players and you need a little bit more of the grit. I think the ideal scenario is you have both of those things in one player. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, who played really hard, wasn't fighting. And I think sometimes we like, we put the fighting into the the grit. I, I don't think it's always that way. Like, David Perron was a pain in the ass to play against. Absolutely sucked because he was just really tough on the puck. You couldn't get it off of his stick. You need a guy like that. Yeah. You, you don't have one of those guys right now, really. You know who else was really tough to play against? Ryan O'Reilly. Because he's just always around you yeah. while you're on the ice. Like, defensively, just a total pain in the ass to go up against. So I don't know that it's necessarily like, this is just for me. I can only speak for myself. I don't know if it's about, hey, they don't have enough dudes that are going out there and fighting. No. I don't think they have enough guys that are going out there and playing the full 200-foot game, and they're just, like, good enough to do it. Like, some of the guys on your team right now, let's be honest, like Kevin Hayes, even if he played at 100% capacity every single night, man, he's not Ryan O'Reilly. Like, I could be the best version of myself. I'm not Colin Cowherd. I'm never going to be Colin Cowherd. Like, there's just, there's levels to being... Whatever the peak version of yourself is, whether that's on the ice or in your own respective um, status of your, your your job, your workplace environment, right? Um, and I think the Blues just need more dudes. Uh, yeah. They need more dudes, and they need dudes that play the quote-unquote right way. Those guys that you just referenced, they always made it tough on the other teams to play. And it wasn't about fighting. It was like you referenced. They were always on top of them. They never gave them an opportunity to breathe. And I think when you go to the defensive side, you need guys that make it difficult for other players to go to the front of the net. You don't have that right now. You don't have anybody that is willing to make the other player pay the price if you're going to stand in front of the net. Remember what Craig Button said? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's just... Not scared to go up against the St. Louis Blues blue line. Right. Nobody is. You know why the Blues struggle to get to the front of the net against the other teams? Because they don't want to... They don't want to have the repercussions of when you stand in front of the net other than a couple of guys. The Blues just don't make it difficult to stand in front of the blue paint. That's where you need to upgrade, but it's not just going out there. I've heard people reference, like, go get a Joel Edmondson. Yeah, Joel Edmondson's great, but Joel Edmondson's not able to play an 82-game schedule. You need to get somebody who has that top two, top four pair talent, but also is willing to make it difficult for the other teams. Yeah, go make, go get a good defenseman. Go get a good defenseman with size that plays with grit. Yeah. If you can do that, and by the way, it ain't easy to find that no. guy. Everybody wants that player. He's expensive via contract or he's expensive to acquire uh, via trade it's really hard to acquire the types of players that we're talking about that's why they're not often available but right. that's that, why it's like you, the if you go get a defenseman that plays 13 14 minutes a night how is that benefiting you like when he's on the ice for 13 minutes that's his great name's marco scandal yeah <laughs> or his name's tyler tucker yeah. like you have those sixth seventh defensemen that play the way we're talking about you need the dude that can play 23 absolutely against the most difficult matchups possible with colton pareko next to his absolutely side. alex will be on the pregame coverage for blues versus blackhawks tonight starting at six o'clock that'll be right here in your home of the blues 101 espn 314-399-9646 is the air comfort service text line for questions and answers that's next here on 101 espn
Alex Ferrario with you to talk about my friends at Rhino Shield. When it comes to the exterior of your home, your business, you want it looking as great as you can. And that's why I'm telling you to call Rhino Shield because I personally have done this with my house, but there's businesses around the area that you can drive by and see the work that Darren and his team do at Rhino Shield. Just for reference, up by me, there's a uh, there's a complex plaza that has a couple of different stores, and it was run down a couple of years ago, and then they did the upgrade to it. It looks brand new. And when it comes to your business, your church, you want them to look brand new. And Rhino Shield, what they do, it's a two to three coating process that is thicker than any type of paint you're going to buy over the counter and any hardware store. And what that means is you're not going to have to worry about painting it year after year after year because of the water, which Rhino Shield is 100% waterproof because of the UV rays. They deflect 90% of those UV rays. If you use just cheap paint, those elements are going to deteriorate, not with Rhino Shield. So give Darren a call today. Tell him Alex Ferrario sent you and get that free quote on how you can upgrade the exterior of your home, your church, your office, your company, whatever it is. 877-25-RHINO, 877-25-RHINO.com. Alongside Alex and T-Bone on BK3, 143-999-6468 is the Air Comfort Service text line for questions and answers from the 314. Guys, I have one question. Why, why, why is Brandon Crawford playing today? 
Splits. Well, it's raining. And Mason Wynn had a lot of diving plays the last couple of days, yeah. and you got to make sure you tend to that body with I mean, the wear be, and tear. To be fair, he's played in every game since their last off day, right? I don't, unless there's one I'm forgetting. Hey, that's like four I was going to say that's four games. games. <laughs> yeah, so we can't five. play because we can't play five. five before he's got a day off. Look, man, I, if he plays five games, they want to give him a day off. I'm totally fine it's with the that. The 22 year old can't play five games in a row. I, I actually, I don't mind. I don't mind one day off a week. Uh, I mind it when he's like your most impactful hitter right now. I get it. I did not like two games, two days off in the first week of the season. I thought that was totally unnecessary. Now, as you get into the heart of the season, if they do one day off a week, that's fine. One day off a week means you're playing 145 games this year. You're fine. That That's a good number of games for Mason Wynn in his rookie year to be playing. I thought them getting him two days off in the first week was just a totally unforced error. So that, that's kind of where I fall on this. I, I think that people get I, – I find myself in this category sometimes. We get so locked into winning that day that it's like always put out your best lineup. Sure, it's 162 games. And if you're always winning for that day, you're going to end up with dudes that are just running on fumes. How many times have we seen this with Tommy Edmond? We used to see this a lot with Matt Carpenter. So Matt Carpenter would get year. to like August and there would just be nothing left. He had zero energy left. It had all been sapped earlier in the season. De Young is a great example of this. I think Goldie, there have been times where we've seen some of this from him as well, where we get to the end of the season. It's like, dude, who is this guy? Because this is not the player we watched earlier on in the season. So I don't mind one day off a week for even my prime players shortstop there's a lot of energy that you are expending i understand he's very young but one day off a week is fine i don't love it but whatever i i i at least understand it to a degree if they start doing the two days off thing again though i'm gonna lose my mind <laughs> better matchups man better matchups uh, tarps on the field guys came over uh I, I do wonder if that's part of it as well. I'm sure that yeah. is part Where of it. They like, realize hey, not, don't focus on getting ready for the game because it's off. And if we don't play even better and two days off in a row with the day off tomorrow, it's like there's real value in having an off day today. It's why I'm genuinely surprised that Nolan Arenado is playing today. And I do think it comes back to, he told them probably I want to work through this. Did you guys see um, Turner Ward, like basically being one-on-one, -on -one, like his companion for the game the other night? I thought yeah. that was interesting. Yeah, I, it makes sense, too, especially the way he's struggling, continuously talking with him, trying to work through things. And we know Turner Ward has the respect of that locker room. You know, it, it, there is no doubt in my mind that he is going to work with Nolan Arenado consistently until he gets through this. And, and honestly, I don't mind the idea of Arenado saying, just let me work through this. You know, I know, like you brought up earlier, like give him a full day to reset. I mean, if Arenado feels it's best for him at this point in his career to continue to try and get those at-bats, I'm willing to continue throwing them out there until it just is clear, like, hey, it's not working right now. Let's try the mental reset now. 314-399-9646 is the Air Comfort Service text line. Alex, this one's for you from the 980. Guys, Doug Armstrong tried to shed one of the defenseman contracts last season, and he failed. If he's not able to shed any of those contracts this offseason, in your opinion, why should Blues fans be excited about the team going into the 2025 season? <laughs> I, I'm not sure I can tell you on that. I, I I think you have to move on from one of those defensemen. You have to make some type of significant change to the team if you want people to be excited. Because I think you you used the, we'll sell you on that was a bad season last year and we expect it to be a one-off card. And look, if you believe that the, the Blues are ahead of schedule because they were competing for the playoffs and were in that middle tier, fine. But... You can't go back next season with the same roster and sell it to the fans saying we're going to be a playoff team because that's the next step next year. You got to be a playoff team. If you felt like this year you were going to be in the conversation, the next step is you got to be in the playoffs. Yeah. And, and you can't sell that with the roster. I, I think, I, think if, I have a different take yeah, on this. I, I think if they're going to sell the fan base on what they're doing, they need to come out next year and say it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. That's where I'm at. I, I genuinely think, and I, Alex, we just have a fundamental disagreement on this and – there's just no patching the divide. I think generally speaking, young players have a tougher time getting good as quick as we want them to, especially in the NHL. Um, and so if they are going to get younger next year, which I think should both be the expectation and the hope is that they have a younger lineup on opening night of next year than they did on opening night of this year. I think my expectation going into next season is that they actually get worse from a overall results standpoint 
I also think it could be more fun to watch because instead of watching uh, Kasperi Kapanen, you're watching Zach Bolduc every single night. Instead of watching, at least early in the season, Oscar Sundquist, who I know we, we all love, but we know three, five, four or five years from now when they're really good again, he's probably not going to be on the roster. You see Zach Dean out there. So I, and I think those players might be worse, honestly, on a night in, night out basis overall than the players that they're replacing. So it's hard for me to sell you on that, but I think that's where they're at. I mean, those I mean, those guys are playing right now, and I don't feel like people are having a lot of fun watching them. Um, <laughs> I, I enjoy watching Bulldogs. No, that's fair. I, I like the growing pains. Yeah, I like uh, watching the Cardinals right now with all of the young guys out there. The guys I, that I get frustrated by are Goldie and Hart. But I do. Th- but I think that's where the Blues are at right now. The people that you're getting frustrated with are the veterans that you're expecting more from, and that's how I think you can make it competitive. But you're going to have to do something that doesn't seem very possible and move assets for players that bring in a different element to your team. I'm talking not just the defenseman. Like, that's the one we always focus in on and say, well, you got to get rid of the defenseman. Guys, there's not any good defensemen on the free agent market that make your team better. So, unfortunately, you might be stuck with these defensemen until a trade becomes available to you or somebody becomes a free agent that you can pounce on, other than Noah Hannafin, who I like. But this is where the forward side this is why people get angry when we bring up Kyrou and Buchnevich of potentially trading them if it's not working with those two guys those are the pieces that can bring you in something different the question is can you can you assess the assets that are out there and bring them in that match the identity of what you're trying to match with the team and that's where I'm not sure the Blues know what their identity is right now which is why I always go back to before you do any of this worry about the coach I also just think that like they might be looking at the 2026 season as when they're really going to be competing again. And if that's the case, man, a lot of what you do this offseason is just like, hey, let's patch holes and let's see what these young guys can do. And that's not a sexy way to go about it, but it might be the reality of where they're at. All right, coming up in 15 minutes, we'll get to more likely to happen. You give us two scenarios. We'll tell you which one is more likely. But next, are you ready to say today? I don't know how many of you guys are going to be with me on this one. That the Cardinals rotation is meaningfully better than it was at this time last year. We'll talk about it next year on 101 ESPN. Alex Ferrario with you to talk about my insurance agent. Tracy Bibb has been taking care of the Ferrario family when it comes to our car and auto, our car and home insurance. And what I love about Tracy Bibb is she's helping us save money on car and home insurance. If you speak to any insurance agent, you'll find out the prices that go with it. For certain vehicles, it's through the roof. Your house insurance goes up because of the market. All of that is insanity. And that's why I use Tracy Bibb because she is always accomplishing the ability to save you money. But she She's so upfront with you about this. She always preaches it's not a matter of if something happens, it's when something happens. And Tracy's giving you calls all the time, making sure you know what's going on. She's keeping you up to date when your insurance needs to be renewed. And if you have an issue, you call her, she answers. There's no waiting around. It's what I love about Tracy Bibb. So give her a call today if you're with another insurance agency and find out why Tracy is the way to go. 314-328-4260. You get a free non-committal quote by mentioning my name. She'll even cancel your previous insurance with so you could get over with her. 314-328-4260. It's no fib. You're always in great hands with the bib.
Double play ball. There's one. Got to hurry. Got him. What a way for Sonny Gray to debut in St. Louis. He's through five with the lead. One nothing here at Bush Stadium. So what it sounded like last night on Bally Sports Midwest. Sounds like we're going to try to get this game in uh, coming up here just a little bit today. So the Cardinals back in action for the rubber match, but against the Philadelphia Phillies. Alex, Sonny Gray looked awesome last night. Couldn't ask for a whole lot more. Complete control from start to finish. He had that pitch count limit of 65 pitches. In that constraint, he was able to get through five full innings. Did not allow any walks on the day, which I thought was impressive. Struck out five, got six swings and misses on the 32 swings in which he induced. Made it through five again on 65 pitches. Sonny Gray is the frontline starter that the Cardinals have been looking for since basically Adam Wainwright was removed from his prime. Or if you want to go back to 2019 when Jack Flaherty looked like he was going to be the next guy and then, of course, took a step back the following year. Sonny Gray is that guy. The question is what's behind him and how much do you trust the two through five behind him? I am willing today to say this. The Cardinals rotation is better than it was last year. Definitively. By a sizable margin, in my opinion. I think where things get a little dicey is how much better because the bar is so incredibly low from where it was at this point last year. And what does that mean for them in the grand scheme of things? Are you guys willing to meet me, though, at the front end of what I said, where the Cardinals rotation is today meaningfully better than it was at this point last year? I don't know if I'm ready to say meaningfully better. I will agree that they're better because you have a stopper now. Uh, And I saw it with five innings of Sonny Gray that you've got a guy that if things are going bad, you know you're going to get back on the right track because of him. But that's one guy, and you're better because you didn't have that guy last year. It just felt like it was a trickle-down of being bad and then bad and then worse, and then it was just awful. Where I'm not ready to jump on board with, like, definitively better, I still don't know what my other four guys are. Steven Matz looks awesome, but as we've talked about in the past, you typically get this from Steven Matz. You get four or five games, and then it goes south, and then he gets injured, and then it's like, wait, what's going on? And he's in the bullpen, and you're back. Lance Lynn, for a lot of people, looked great in that first game. Maybe this is just the negative part of me, but I feel like the rain helped him out there because that that looked like it was going south quick. And then this last one didn't look too good against the Marlins. Gibson, great in the first one, not so great in the second one. And then Miles Michaelis, he's getting away with it, but man, it doesn't look pretty. So uh, it's working right now. I think I still have to see a few more starts before I can jump on and say this is definitively better than where you were because... If it doesn't continue this way, which I feel like it's going to be very difficult to sustain this success with at least two of these guys, now we're back to having one guy that you can rely upon, which I felt like is kind of what they were last year. Let me ask this a different way then. How much better is Kyle Gibson than Adam Wainwright? Well, to be a very low bar, but it's correct. But Wayno was a starter in the rotation last year for 21 starts. He finished with the second most starts on the team last year. I mean, he's significantly better, yeah. right? I, I'm. I think, yeah, he's better. Because this is what we're we're discussing. He's like, giving you innings. He's better. Look, we're going from what did they have in that spot of the rotation last year to what do they have in that spot of the rotation <laughs> this year? He's better. He's giving you innings. But if we keep getting the Marlins game where it's seven runs through yeah, six, but I mean, I mean, had, is it really better? Yeah, he's had ten percent of his starts oh, that it looked like that over the last three seasons. He's had the most starts in Major League Baseball over the last five years. And in that time, he has been significantly better than Wayno was. Yes, I'm willing and comfortable saying that he will not have a 7.4 ERA, which is what Adam Wainwright had at the end of last season. Adam Wainwright had one of the worst seasons we've ever seen, not by my analysis, like my opinion, one of the worst starting pitching years ever in the history of Major League Baseball for a player that made 20 starts or more. That's what Wayno was last year. I'm comfortable whether you want to compare it to Mike or to to Matt's or excuse me to um, Lynn or Gibson. They are both significantly better than what Wayno was this time last year. What about for Flaherty? Do you think that Jack Flaherty, who last year made 20 starts for you in 110 innings, had a 4.5 ERA? Do you guys believe that either Gibson or Lynn, one of those two, whoever you want, will be better in a meaningful way this year than Flaherty was for you last year. I think they'll be about the same. I think that's a wash for me. Yeah, I I think the jury's still out on if you're going to get much better from that because Jack's issue was walks and didn't eat innings. 
We'll see if Lynn, I would go to Lynn with him. Is Lynn able to eat innings in a more effective way would be what I'm still, and sure. that, and I think the jury's still out on that. And look, he probably would have gone more than four innings in LA if the rain doesn't happen, but he wiggled out of danger. And then the home run ball, which bit him last year, bit him in the Miami start. And it's just too early for me to really make the conclusion that Lynn is definitely better than Flaherty. Fair. I think at a worst case scenario, it's a push. I don't think any of us would say that Flaherty was significantly better. No. Every time Flaherty took them out, I didn't know what the hell to expect, which is kind of the way I feel with Lance Lynn. Fair. <laughs> yeah. And the reason why I'm go- going down this path is because I think Gray is better than Jordan Montgomery. Like, just flat out a better pitcher than Jordan Montgomery. I know people will bring up, oh, but BK, look at the play. Yeah, sure. Look at look at the regular season success. Those two pitchers were available on the market. I think most teams would tell you they preferred Sonny Gray over Jordan Montgomery if you could put a one-year deal in front of either of them. I mean, I'll take playoff success over regular season <laughs> success, but... Michael is still right. here. Matt's still here. I think this version of Matt's is significantly better than the early version of Matt's that we saw a year ago, so much so that he was pulled from the rotation last year. This year, he's looked like one of your best starters in the rotation so far this year. I think it's meaningfully better. What does that mean, though? Like, if they are a decent... If I end up being right... Doesn't happen often, but let's go down this path where I'm right and they are significantly better, a good bit better this year in the rotation than they were last year. Do they have enough around them to make that matter? Because we sat all offseason, just improve the rotation. This team can be good. We trust the offense. We think the offense is going to be better. It looks like the defense should be better. Base running should be better. Do you guys think that they have those other pieces that are necessary for the rotation to matter now? You want to say it together? Yeah. One, two, two three. three. No. no. That's a problem. It's it's the pitch. That's the problem. And I don't even know if it's the pieces that are around. It's the pitching still pitching. not good enough. This yeah. is why I this is why I hate this conversation, this BK. A, okay. Here's why I hate this conversation. Yeah, we're talking about a regular season what did we success. Talk, what did we talk about in right, the offseason? Like, can we get through 162 no, first? Like, just to, like, let's push off the playoff success, playoff talk conversation. Now you're starting to sound like Mo. No, but I, I think it's a fair con Because, like, we'll get to the deadline and we'll figure that out then. And, and if they fail, then we should crush them. They deserve to be crushed if they don't go out and add the necessary starter. Oh. I get it, Alex. Here the the, I get it. I'm, I'm with you. But let's focus right now on can they be better this year? Can they be a meaningfully better team? Because that's all that we have in front well, of them. I mean, that's a low bar to clear. Yeah, I think you're meaningful. You're, you're better than last year. I mean, I hope you're better than last year. Go on, T-Bone, with what you Let were saying. Let me ask us a different well, way. The problem I have, it, it, we said in the offseason we should not be building a better team upon last year's team. That building the rotation shouldn't be how do you approve upon last year's rotation. It was how do you make it better to where it is meaningfully better. And what they did was not meaningfully better. What what we're talking about is did they approve upon the 2023 rotation? Yeah, by doing the bare minimum. Like that's why I have an issue with the conversation. Agreed. Is I I think you're right. I think you're 100 percent right. I can already tell you the rotation is better than it was last year. It's not meaningfully better though. Like I and, and look, I wouldn't even. I'll still say the jury's out on it because I look. I, we cannot make a conclusion on the rotation with not even guys going three times through. They got to sure, go five times through before we can fully say it. But I can tell you right now, I don't feel like it's meaningfully better. It, it, I see still flaws in this rotation significantly. It's interesting because I do that. For, maybe for that's me, just a different like vibe, like a different interpretation because the numbers do not agree with me. Well, here. Yeah, you come into yeah. the office every day and you're like, I love this team. I, I mean, Alex, look at each other and go, what? <laughs> I, I, I like this team. I, I think this team is. I, I like the young talent. I really like the Which young talent. Which all of us agree on. The young talent is why there's optimism. The I, pitching is not why there's optimism. See, but I, that's where I'll, like for myself, again, I can only speak for myself. I disagree a bit, is I, I do think that the pitching has looked significantly better. And I also think that we, we talk about the pitching like it's just this one thing, right? It's just the rotation that was bad last year. The bullpen was an atrocity a year ago. It was a sieve from start to finish. I know we all hate the blown save stat, T-Bone, but they blew saves it. left and right, man. It was constant. It was horrible. And as I watch the team this year, man, this bullpen is not just meaningfully better than last year. Like that that bar, I'm, I'm with you. I'm kind of using a false pretense on yeah. the, the idea that better, better, than, better than what the yeah. rotation was last year. Like low bar to clear BK, one of the worst the rotations in the history of Major Don't League Baseball. Remember? Yeah, they're better. Cool. I'm with you. I, I get it. I just, you know, it's fun with numbers. Um, <laughs> Nerd. <laughs> the, the bullpen. Spoilers. Like, stack up the bullpen compared to good bullpens across the league. 
It matches up, man. Their bullpen is good this year and, that and, and should be better when Riley O'Brien eventually returns, when Keenan, Keenan Middleton eventually returns. But that we all agree with. The bullpen sure. is better. But that's a big part of the conversation. Like, Not if it's Kyle Gibson giving up seven runs by the man, third I inning. I think you're latching on to one start that's just like a total outlier. I'm not, though. Lance Lynn was four in the first inning. Yeah, and then he gave you innings. Like, fine, but you're down by so much that you're doing what I said at the offseason. You're going to be relying heavily on your offense to be awesome. Those are the outlier performances, though. Those were, like, the exception to the rule last year was not having one of those performances. This year, we can identify two games, two games so far, in which it's just been over basically the moment that it started. So, like, is it... I just think it's a. I reject the notion that this te- this team is anywhere close pitching wise to where they were a year ago. But I think the really interesting conversation, and I think there is one to be had here, is okay. So you did improve the rotation. the The bullpen is wildly better than it was a year ago. Is the offense good enough? Like we've spent all of this time chasing our tail on the pitching, chasing our tail. The the Cardinals told us it's pitching, 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 guys, and I agreed with them. And I have been the one that is selling like crazy. Guys, this could be the 2013 Cardinals. Look at this offense. Look at the talent that they've assembled. It doesn't look that way early on, man. And we're only 12 games into the year, so it is super early. But the offense for me is the thing that I've got my eye on. I think the rotation's better. I think the bullpen is pretty damn good. The offense has got to get things going, or it doesn't matter if I'm right or you're right or T-Bone's right or if it's somewhere in the middle of all three of our opinions on the pitching side of things. This offense is the foundation of the team, and they stink right now for the most part. Yesterday, they were better. Go out there against Zach Wheeler. If you put up three runs in that game, you did your job. But, guys, the the, the offense is what I've got my eye on. Are, are you guys am I, am I, I off there? So I have my eye on the offense but I'm actually not worried about the offense yet. I, I still think it's so small of a sample size that I'm not worried. The only guy I'm worried about genuinely is Arnado. But I, I'm still going to hold the faith of, okay, Arnado's going to get this figured out at some point. We get a month into the year and he is still struggling. All right, now let's have a conversation about this offense not being where it's going to be. I'm not concerned about the offense. I, I think the offense as a whole, I agree with you on offense. You know, I, I think the offense is going to go through a 10-game stretch where it's going to look pathetic, and it's going to go through a 10-game stretch where you're like, holy crap, that's great. It's just a f- ebb and flow with an offense. That's how it works. I know Alex doesn't like that, but <laughs> that's how I feel the offense is. So I'm not concerned about the offense. I think the offense is in one of those ruts to where Goldie could click today and the offense takes off. Arnado could click today and the offense takes off. And the fact that Contreras continue, it, not continues – had a weird injury that's kept him out of the lineup is making this thing look even worse than it actually is. And Herrera's playing really well in his spot. Like, I'm not concerned about the offense. I know the numbers look bad. I'm not overly concerned. I have an eye on it, but I just think the offense is fine. But here's here's where I, and maybe this is where I'm looking at different than you are. I'm still looking at this team of, okay, I understand they have to get to the postseason first, but for them to win in the postseason – your offense is going to get shut down. We've seen it. When an ace has his A game, look at Tyler Glass now. Look at Bobby Miller. Hell, look at Zach Wheeler last night. They did a great yep. job to get the three runs that they mm-hmm. did last night. He was awesome. Off- offenses get shut down. I love the Cardinals' offense, and I know they're struggling as a whole. They will be shut down by a legitimate top-end starter. Because every do- every, every offense does. does. We see it with the Dodge. Like The Dodgers and, and get to the postseason, to, to this and point, they struggle with front-end starters. You saw thinking. Sonny Gray shut down a really good Phillies offense last night. The problem is, is I still look at this rotation as a whole, and I say it is not a postseason rotation, well, and, 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 and that's where I come back on this and say it's not good enough. And, and that's uh, they're I'm, losing already. Is I'm, that? I'm, so why you keep looking over me? Yeah, nice. see, the I, I'm not worried about the <laughs> offense. Significantly better. Uh, to, to be fair, it was an unearned run. It was an error. It's, it looks like it's a monsoon out there. I can't believe they're playing. <laughs> Oh, now we're blaming the weather conditions. You know who's playing in the rain as well? The Phillies. Uh, I, I know. We'll see what they look like when they go into the field with that defense. <laughs> sure, it'll go super well for them. All right, we've gone way too long here. More likely to happen is next.
314-399-9646 is the Air Comfort Service text line for more likely to happen. You give us two scenarios. We'll tell you which one is more likely to happen. Guys, more likely to happen. Nolan Arenado hits 30 home runs this year for the Cardinals or the Cardinals trade for a starting pitcher at the deadline who will start a playoff game for them. Oh, I see what you did there. You you kept it as generic as you can. Yeah, buddy. Because I'm going to have to say that one now because they're going to trade for like a, a Rich Hill or something like that and be like, he could start for us in the playoffs. Quintana's so going to be a Cardinal again. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to go with that one. Man, if you would have went with a, a number one starting game one, I would have said Arenado in a heartbeat, but I'll take the uh, latter one on that. Uh, I'm going to say more likely Arenado hits 30 home runs. I'm going to keep the faith, as Bon Jovi would say. Um, I... I think he will get it turned around. And I think the most encouraging part, if there is an encouraging part for the starts of the season for Arnado, to me, he looks healthy. Um, defensively, he's making plays. He made a barehanded play last night down the third base line and got an Almost out. Made another, he made another. Yeah, yeah he there. made one. He was one I for two. I said about Mason Wynn two nights ago also. Um, I uh, <laughs> I think since he's healthy, if he, if he gets locked in offensively, he can hit 30 home runs. So I'm going to say it's more likely he hits 30 home runs. Yeah, they're trading for a starter at the deadline. I think this team's better than you guys do. I just give them more credit than you do. I, I think that they will be in it, and when they are in it, they will trade for somebody that they view, even if we disagree with them, as being better than whoever you deem to be their number three starter. Hey man, I, I think they will have somebody that slots in ahead of Lynn and Gibson, and one of those guys will head to the pen, most likely Lance Lynn. Hey, man, I do it too, because the Blues put money in my pocket, Cards put money in your pocket. You That's go. why we're so positive with it. They don't, they don't, I, I so they don't put money in either of our pockets. the Cardinals would send me a direct deposit every month yeah. because, man, I would be able to get my basement renovated this summer in an easier <laughs> gonna say. way financially. Believe so me, BK, and, be I, BK and I wouldn't be who we are if, if we were getting financially. By the way, if you're a company that does uh, basement renovations oh, and yeah? you want to endorse this show for whatever reason, uh, feel free to give me a call. Or DM me on Absolutely. <laughs> we'll get in on this. I love this one. <laughs> Alex, we could use it too. So. <laughs> More likely to happen, guys. Drew Bannister returns as the head coach, or the entire coaching staff is new next year? Oh, that's really interesting. Um, I heard the opening drive talk about this, and I think it was Danny Mack that asked the question, are, are all of them gone next year? And I mean, I, by all of them, you're talking Ott, Weber, Babcock, Jr. Yeah, really, Ott's just the only one that I would like. That you'd be surprised by. Yeah. Well, you don't want the skills coach here, man? Babcock? I forgot he was a coach. I mean, so. if you bring in somebody new, I think you're probably doing it with a name, like a real name mm -hmm. that people would recognize, even a, a casual hockey fan. And they're probably going to want to bring in their guys. And I think they're going to bring in somebody new. So I'll go with an entirely new coaching staff, even if that means losing Steve Ott. So yeah. I'll, I'll go with That's that That's a tough side. one. I'll say more likely they have an entire new coaching staff. And I, to be honest with you, I'm not sure how much they would really care if they let go of Vod. Sorry, Op. But, I mean, Damn, they took the power play away from him. You know, there's been multiple times where he's had his job taken away from him when he's been on the staff. No, man, it was the Craig one McTavish. That, <laughs> wolf. Uh, the, one, the one that they I... flipped those roles so many times that I, I lose yeah, track I, at this point of who's Basically what Steve Vod is, I think is the he's one, the face-off guy. Yeah, I think the one that they would keep would be more likely would be Weber if they were to keep him. Because really? Because they've implemented this defensive scheme. And, look, I, I don't think the defense has been better. I think well, we over-credit how well it's been. But, but the early portion, it looked good. <laughs> Lately, it is not. Yeah, I... I I think if they're going to keep anybody, it would be Weber, but I don't think they keep anybody. If you hire a new coach, why would he want the leftovers from Craig Berube's staff? Yeah. It just doesn't make sense. That's where I'm at, too. I, I do believe they're going to bring in a new coach. And the tough part is I put these two ultimatums. The middle part is probably more likely to where they come in and they keep one and they get rid of the rest. But I'm going to say it's more likely that you get a whole new staff because my guess is Doug's going to find a coach and give the coach all of the opportunities to run the team and take it over as he pleases. T-Bone? Guys, more likely to get more at-bats in the three-hole this season, Nolan Gorman or Lars Nupar? Um, I think they're going to stick with Nolan Gorman I for a little too. bit, even though I personally think they should go to Lars Nupar there. I think Gorman's a six-hole hitter. Like The way that I view a guy like Nolan Gorman is if, if your value to the team is increasing the ceiling, not the floor, you should be in the six-hole or the or five. But I... Maybe I'm old school in this regard. I view the five hole as somebody that's like more of a contact hitter, a guy that can just like in any situation, like Yachty or Molina, prime Yachty is like the prime five hole hitter. Know what the situation calls for, 
and do whatever is necessary in that spot. That's not an old core, man, man. He's not, he's not the situational hitter. Like, I think Contreras fits that role. Herrera seemingly fits that role. I think eventually, if you want Jordan Walker to, he, he probably could down the road. I don't think that's Gorman. He's either a three or a six hole hitter for you. I think he's more of a six than a three. So I'll go Gorman, even though I personally would lean more towards Newt Bar. Yeah, I, I think Newt Bar is going to be hitting like in the two spot or gets in there and hits it like the six spot. I, I think Gorman stays at the three. I just, Ollie's not going to move away from that power and he loves the left, right, left, right. And I know Newt Bar is the lefty, but I, I think they're going to keep Gorman there. So I'll say it's Gorman. Yeah, I would say it's more likely Gorman as well. I, I just don't view Newt as a three-hole hitter. That's right. And I can, like, squint and see how Gorman is. Like, when peak, Gorman peak is... large, man. Yeah, I know. Uh, when, when Gorman is swinging the bat well, and he's in one of those hot streaks, I totally see how you put him in that three spot, and you go, this is great. But when he goes through that, like, the first, whatever it was, eight games, striking out 50% of the time, that's tough as a three-hole hitter. I, I'm not sure this team has a legit well, let me rephrase it i think they have a legitimate three-hole hitter but they'd have to move away from what ollie doesn't like they'd have to move Contreras to the three go three righties in a row goldie Contreras, arenado and then that five spot to your point on a contact hitter you could go newt and then gorman but you've got back-to-back lefties and they just won't do that so here's the list of players that spent more than 350 plate appearances in the three hole last year there's 12 of them okay austin riley nate lau uh, Ian Happ, Will Smith, Jose Ramirez, Anthony Santander, Juan Soto, uh, Vlad Guerrero Jr., Luis Robert, Justin Turner, Jordan Alvarez, and Bryce Harper. The exact list of the players that ha- had hit below 245 in that spot. Zero? Zero. Yeah. None of them hit below 245. And that's my thing with Nolan Gorman batting there. He's just not the guy that's going to – he doesn't profile that way, man. You need somebody that hits – a higher average maybe what they do is they just go back to what they did previously where it's donovan newt at the top and you have goldie batting third that yep. that could be something they go back to as well and just uh, say you know what forget the left right it doesn't matter our guys at the top are left-handed hitters that hit either side guys in the middle are right-handed hitters that hit either side let's just get our best guys in the best spots for them so i could see them doing that as well all right 314-399-9646 is the air comfort service text line for more likely to happen let's get to a few of these on the text line rapid fire style more likely to happen tyler o'neill is your al mvp or a cardinal hits at least 35 home runs uh, i'm gonna say a cardinal hits 35 home runs uh I know we joked around yesterday and made T-Bone mad, but I, I do think Tyler O'Neill, even if he stays healthy, somebody in the American League is going to emerge better than Tyler O'Neill. I, I just don't see it lasting 162 games, whereas on the Cardinals, I could see out of all of these power hitters we're talking about, once the bats get hot, I could see somebody getting to 35. Yeah, I'd say more likely 35 home runs. I, I think probably the only guy that I would feel really confident that is Gorman. Um, there's a couple guys that could get their squeak to it, but I, guys... O'Neill is the strongest baseball player I think I've ever seen, whilst also being the softest baseball player I've ever yeah. seen. So he is not going to stay healthy for a one full 162 to win an MVP. T-bone from the top rope. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I I'm just saying T-bone. what Ollie was thinking. Uh, everything man. T-bone just said is 100 percent true. All right, more likely to happen: the Cardinals spend more days in last place in the division or first place in the division. Well, you know already, where I stand, first place. <laughs> they've already been added up a, to the. Yeah. If there was a place above first, I would take that one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, they've already gotten a couple days in last place. Yeah. So uh, I'll say last place. I would actually lean towards first. I don't think this team is as bad as last year to where they would Hell be yeah, last. Brother. Don't don't brother me. Welcome <laughs> my, I uh, I think they would probably spend more days in like second or third than first. But since it's first or last, I'll take first. All right. Last thing here. More likely to happen. Tiger misses the cut at the Masters or finishes in the top 10? Oh, Tiger misses the cut. My Did dude you see him saying, yeah, my I dude, hurt every day? Yeah, my dude can't even walk the course. They're doing a par three Not tournament good, today. Man. My guy can't even walk the course. I'm sorry, Tiger, but... I think we're at that point where it's, hey, you know, you, you he's got probably a, done. You got a beautiful golf course in Branson, yeah. Missouri, so go enjoy that, my man. Yeah, I'm going to go more likely misses the cut. All right, coming up in 15 minutes, we're going to dive into the junk drawer with the one person in America who actually agreed with Alex on the Eclipse. We'll get into that coming up Let's at go. 1245, but coming up next. God, I hope it's a good person. There's a question for you guys. I think the answer is a little bit more difficult to come to than many of our texts will indicate. Would you be willing to trade both Jordan Cairo and Pavel Buchnevich if it meant getting Brady Kachuk in return? We'll talk about that next year on 101 ESPN.
Alongside Alex, I'm Brandon Kylie. We got to tell you about our friends over at Green Envy Lawn Care. Alex, I have a little boy running around the house right now, and in fact, he's crawling around very quickly around the house, which means my time more valuable than it has ever been before. I just don't have the time anymore to go out there, put down all of the different things that you need to make sure that your lawn looks the best possible. So instead, I give my friends over at Green Envy Lawn Care a call. They come out, comes out every couple of weeks, and they put down the fertilizer that's necessary for that time in the season. And Alex, they have my lawn looking fantastic. Right and now. it's one thing to get it ready for the season. It's another thing to maintain the good look of that lawn. And that's why I love Green Envy for me because, man, they get it looking so good. But then throughout the summer when it's so hot, they're coming out consistently laying down the uh, weed killer, laying down the seed to keep it healthy. And they leave me tips on how I can cut the grass correctly and when I need to water it so I can keep it healthy. It's green from the start of spring until the end of fall because of Green Envy. Give them a call today. Tell them BK and Ferrario sent you 636-757-1600. That's 636-757-1600. Terry Hunter here with a Sports Center update driven by Johnny Londoff, Chevrolet, and Johnny Londoff Auto Plex. The Cardinals and Phillies are in action right now as they are playing through the rain. They are heading to the home half of the second. Philadelphia is on top over the Cardinals, two to nothing. Lance Lynn is on the mound for St. Louis. Aaron Nola is getting the start for the Philadelphia Phillies. And the Blues back in action tonight as they take on the Chicago Blackhawks. Well, a pregame coverage starting at 6 o'clock with Alex Ferrario and Joey Vitale. Then Joey will join Chris Garber for puck drop at 7. This sports update is driven by Johnny Londoff. Find your road shop 24-7 at Londoff.com, Londoffautoplex.com. Are you kidding me? Alongside Alex and T-Bone, I'm BK. I want to say this on the front end. This is not based on anything reporting-wise. This is based on pure speculation, but... There's been a lot of noise, once again, that Brady Kachuk might be interested in leaving Ottawa. It's a bad situation. They're a bad team, and we'll see what comes of this. Probably nothing would be my guess. However, if this reporting, this speculation ends up having some legs to it, 
the Blues are a team that I would imagine would be interested in bringing Brady back home here to St. Louis. I, I would imagine 25 teams in the NHL would at least make a call. You can't mess that up twice, right? <laughs> but a lot of teams would be interested. Fewer teams that would have a legitimate package to offer for Ottawa. Ottawa has a couple of different routes that they could go, Alex. If you're trading Brady Kachuk, you're either going the full rebuild path, which means just picks, prospects, whatever, just young assets is what you'd want. Or you're thinking to yourself, you know what, let's let's repurpose this money. Let's try to find a way to do this differently with a new version of our club. And for the Blues, that might mean, hey, what if we offered the best thing that we can with the assets that we have, which would be something like Jordan Kyrou plus Pavel Buchnevich, and in return, we get Brady Kachuk. Now, Alex, I asked this on Twitter earlier today. Would you be willing to trade Kairou plus Booch for Kachuk? 70% of the responses of the about 700 votes so far have said yes, they would do that. I think it's a little closer for me than it probably is for most people in our listening audience right now. Let me start out with this. Brady Kachuk is a really good hockey player, a really good hockey player. And he does all of the things that we talked about earlier today. Like you want somebody that's willing to go out there and fight. He's the one that is bringing the fight to the game. You want somebody that's going to get physical in front of the net. He does all of that. I do think sometimes we conflate though, like because of his last name, we just assume he's Matthew. Don't know that he's Matthew. Brady Kachuk over the past three seasons has played in 238 games, and in those games has 99 goals and 218 points. Jordan Cairo over the last three seasons, for comparison, again, Chuck had 99 goals in 238 games. Cairo has 91 goals in 231 games. Cairo has 211 points in 231 games. So he's almost the equal in both goals and points while playing seven fewer games than Kachuk over the past three seasons. And I'm adding in another top six forward, a legit top six forward that does everything for you in this trade. So I don't think it's an obvious, can't miss, no doubt about it, absolutely have to do it. If it was Matthew I'm getting a return, I feel that way. I don't know that I feel the exact same way with Brady. I think it. I think I would probably ultimately do it to change up the way that I feel about this team. But I don't know that it's as obvious of a decision as it feels in the moment when you hear the name Kachuk coming back. Alex, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I always agree. I don't think it's as obvious as the text line has been responding with, hell yes, immediately sign on the dotted lines. Like, there is some questioning that goes into it. Ultimately, I would come down and say, yeah, I, I have to do this because the way I look at it as you're trading Kairou for Kachuk. I don't think they re-signed Pavel Buchnevich, so essentially you're going to be trading Pavel Buchnevich as a free agent or a pending free agent at the deadline and getting back picks. So I look at this as you're trading Kairou for Kachuk and you're going to have to fill that Booch role no matter what. And so in that scenario, yeah, I, I, I think it makes sense for the team. Kachuk, although he's not Matthew Kachuk, and uh, again, he is not Matthew Kachuk, he does bring that bite to his game. He is a guy who has scored 35 goals on a very bad Ottawa Senators team. What does that look like? I put this together because when you texted me this yesterday, I was thinking it's like, okay, essentially what you're doing is you're trading $14 million and bringing back $8.2 million by moving out Kairu and Booch, and you're bringing in Kachuk. My guess is you would spend that extra money on another free agent, and let's just put Jake DeBrusque's name in this right now, just for all intents and purposes. I'm going to give you this top nine, and you tell me which one you'd prefer. Brady Kachuk, Robert Thomas, Jake DeBrusque, Bolduc Shen Neighbors, Saad Hayes, Toropchenko. However combination you want to do it, those are the nine players. Or next season, Buchnevich, Thomas, Neighbors, Saad Shen, Kairou, Bolduc Hayes, Toropchenko. So it's Booch and Kairou versus Kachuk and DeBrusque. That's the difference. Correct. And I, I mean, you but I, I also think that's a bit of a false choice because there's also door number three where I trade Buchnevich for other assets and I could still open up that money for DeBrusque, for example, or I could trade Jordan Kairou for other assets and open up that money for somebody else, or I'm trading him for a different asset and I can then go out there and do something different there. Like door number three is probably the door that I'm most interested in, honestly. Door number three worries me though, because I don't want assets. Like if I'm getting another NHL player. But it opens up cap space as well. So but, I can do both, right? Yeah. Like 
it's okay i've got these assets now what do i do with what this war chest of assets that i have available but really the only guy that's going to be available via free agency that you'd spend that assets on that would be an upgrade to me is sam reinhardt but it might be for future years too like i i'm operating right now and we're, we're different in this regard alex I don't think this year is the year that you're going all in for. I yeah. think you're going all in for two years from now. And so maybe like the cap space is not necessarily for 2024. It's for 2026 when those guys would still be on my roster. And I'm bringing in these young players hoping to hit on a couple of them. And if they become a part of my core in 2025 and 2026, when Snuggerud and Dvorsky and Lindstein and all these other young guys are starting to make their way to the NHL level, now I've really got something that I'm building. I just feel like the 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 Kachuk trade in this hypothetical scenario at least puts you in a step in the right direction. You are losing two massive offensive pieces in your top six, and it does leave a void that you're trying to fill. But I think you're bringing a different player into a different environment by moving on from those players. We talk a lot about culture. Does the culture change when you move those guys out and bring a Brady Kachuk in? I don't know. Here's the other caveat into all of this. And why I, I, I'd be hesitant with this. Like, I'm trading two guys to get one player, and I'm still not fixing my defense. And I think the defense is just as important as fixing a, a, a going out and getting some type of playmaker in your top six. I, I, I'm looking at this as could I move a Buchnevich and get a defenseman in the offseason and move a Cairo and get another player in the offseason? It might be difficult, but that's that's where I'm going with this is like the opportunity cost is yeah. really big. So that's door number three for you to where I could do assets with Booch for one thing, Cairo with assets for another thing. Brady Kachuk basically has to be Matthew in order for this trade to be the right move for you. You are all in on Kachuk, neighbors, and Thomas as your top line for the foreseeable future. And then you better be right about the young guys being able to make up your second line. And oh, by the way, I still don't have a second line center in this scenario. Like even with your scenario where you have, yeah, DeBrus, you're still sticking I, with Shen. I don't have a second line center and Shen's a third line yeah, center in my opinion at this point. I think that second line center, you're just waiting for divorce. And, and sure. Probably. That's and, where and I think you're at. I, that That's a scary process, man. Yeah. Because just, like, there's no centers out there that make you better now. I think you're unless you trade right. for it. Um, but this is where things get really difficult is you're, you're so all in on that group of players. I don't know I'm ready, if I'm ready to go that path yet. I, I think tough, I'm man. a couple of years away. And I think <laughs> numbers nerd BK coming in. The numbers on Brady Kachuk's defense are horrible. I mean horrible and have consistently been there. Some of that is probably his line mates. Some of that is probably the fact that he plays for a terrible hockey team. I get all of that. But it's not exactly coming to the Boston Bruins here in St. Louis where, like, what? I'm expecting him to be propped up by everything else that's on the ice with him at all times. I, if I'm moving on from Pavel Buchnevich and the guy that I'm getting in return is not exactly known as a defensive-minded player... I think the defense could end up getting worse from your yeah. forward group by making this kind of a move as well. That's, I don't know that you're better by this kind of a I think your compete move. is better. And that's where that's, fair. that's where it very much changes to me. Like they might not look like a playoff team to you. I think with that move, they play more like a playoff team. That and I agree with. And we talked I didn't even think about this. We talked um last week about the potential of Elias Lindholm stinks the rest of the way. He gets a free agent. What if you went out there and did an Elias Lindholm free agent signing and did your Brady Kachuk? Would you feel a little bit better about I that roster? That'd be really interesting. I mean, yeah. like, I I don't think right now you're you're worried about going out there and finding the talent. I think the talent is coming. I think you need to worry about the compete. And that's what you gotta find a way to fix. And and I I know that for a fact that Brady Kachuk is a competitor. And that changes the dynamic of a team. He's Alex. That's T-Bone on BK. Coming up next, we're going to dive into the junk drawer with the one other guy in America who hated the Eclipse every God, bit as don't much be as Kanye. Alex Please did. don't be Kanye. Let's talk about that next year on 101 ESPN.
Alongside Alex and T-Bone on BK. So Alex was really mad about the excitement that people had. Shocking. Who could have seen that one coming? About the eclipse on Monday. It turns out he wasn't the only one in America that was oh, big time mad about everybody enjoying their time watching the eclipse. The path of totality. Here's Charles Barkley. Uh, I thought it was. I, th I thought I was watching it, and I thought it was maybe the Chuck Blimp that got in the way. Hey, I, I, well, y'all, some of them losers standing outside watching that today. They're not losers. Yes, they are. It, oh, it doesn't it happen just, often. Hey, we've all seen darkness before. Stop it. No, not in, not in the daylight. Yeah, yeah. Come on, man. Come on, yeah. Chuckster. I did hate on the eclipse. Come on, Yo, stop listen. It. I saw a loser standing watching your blimp. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> they were outside. Have you seen Chuck's blimp? Yeah, that's what I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> so you so you're not a fan. You're not a fan uh, of the Well, I'm not gonna sit outside like an idiot and wait on the darkness. Did you not wait I on the wait blimp. till I could have waited? It's gonna be dark when you go Can I ask you a second? Did you ask your family to wait on your blimp outside? I was trying to get my grandson to watch. See, there it is. So what are we talking about? Hey, the eclipse gonna happen again. I ain't gonna ever have another blimp. <laughs> Boy, this was a That's very a good thing. This That's was wrong. a very worthwhile segment. Uh, let's go over to. Uh, I the I love the fact that he called them losers. <laughs> Bunch of losers. I'm actually surprised you didn't say that on Monday. Bunch of, well, I'm not going to be mean like I'm not going to be mean like Charles oh, yeah. Barkley. What I've always said about Alex Ferrario, he's one to hold his tongue. He's he's definitely not going to be mean to somebody. I don't think it's being dumped on the air. I don't think it's right to call. Yeah, that's because BK pissed me off, and I like was so mad. And you have no I filter. Thought, I thought we were on a commercial break. I was so mad. We were clearly I, on air. I know. That's how mad I was. I just I'm not going to belittle people. I just think it's. Dumb to waste your time. So you go stand in the. I mean, BK walked outside. He goes, Oh my God, it's dark when it's light out. What? Cool. Yeah. It's called dusk, people. I found it kind of cool. You know, I can't wait for the next one. Yeah, well, cool. I this is fraud, by the way. Go over to my Twitter account yeah. on that BK Sports yeah, Talk. Alex and you is can, a fraud. You can see him looking straight up at the sun, Without no sunglasses glasses on. Yeah, you're damn right. And uh, well, just taking in idiot. the eclipse. No. Nah. Being an idiot was well. Oh my gosh! I gotta put my glasses on so I can look at the eclipse. Look now, you made me it's call you people and an idiot. Uh, hey, that's a, two. that's a good company to be in. I'm all right with that. Coming up next, <laughs> look at these losers. <laughs> Fans are making their voices heard with their pocketbook, and MLB <laughs> Network had a scathing review of the Cardinals trading Tyler O'Neill. I'll tell you why they're a bunch of losers. Coming up next here on 101 ESPN. Alex Ferrario with you to talk about my friends at Ted Drews. Yeah, I know it's raining outside. Yeah, I know it's not warm. That doesn't mean you can't go get Ted Drews famous frozen custard. That just means you go out there, you buy the frozen custard, you sit in your van, and you enjoy it that way. Because what better way to enjoy time with friends, with family, than to be eating a St. Louis tradition that has been around since 1929. It's just off of Chippewa, open for its 95th season. And you know that high-quality frozen custard it's remains family owned and operated their motto our business is service you feel that the moment you step up to that window to order whatever frozen custard flavor you want and they've got tons of flavors that you can do build the traditions with your friends with your family while you're out there walk across the parking lot off of Chippewa check out their Ted Drew's gift shop where you can shop for uh, whether it's Ted Drew's Route 66 St. Louis themed items you can get clothing you can get hats you could get drinkware you can also buy gift cards which is is really the greatest gift to give somebody that you never know what to do so get on out there start those traditions enjoy some famous frozen custard off of chippewa ted drews it really is good guys and gals
alongside Alex and T-Bone. I'm BK. You got BK and Ferrario here on 101 ESPN. So fans are making their voices heard, Alex, with their pocketbook. And this is where you can really hurt the St. Louis Cardinals. They know on a year-in, year-out basis, they can count on 3.2 million people coming through the stands. And it matters to them. Yes, their TV deal is really good, but the gate revenue, that really drives what the Cardinals are able to do that other teams in a similar size market just can't. They don't have the same number of fans that are regularly expected to come through the turnstiles. That may change this year, though. Alex, on Tuesday night's game, there were only 31,000 tickets that were sold. It was the smallest crowd for a night game in a non-COVID season since Bush 3 opened up in 2006. It was the smallest crowd for any game since June 14th of 2022. That was a doubleheader day against the Pirates. So, again, if you're looking for the similar types of games, night game, weeknight, Bush Stadium 3, smallest paid crowd, unless it was artificially tamped down by the COVID yeah. issues uh, since 2006. I thought Monday might be a blip on the radar. It was possible that it was related to the eclipse. It was possible. <laughs> Secondary market suggested that was not going to be the case. And then yesterday, everything hit in a way where it was like, okay, if this if Monday was a blip, it should show up tonight. Sunny Gray debut, walk-up tickets for that. You're going up against a legitimate ace in Zach Wheeler, big-time name recognition there, a nationally recognized brand with the Phillies, Bryce Harper in town. Um, beautiful weather, great weather night for the Cardinals as well. Like everything should have come together. And yes, attendance is always down in April. Not like this. What did you make last night, Alex, for Sonny Gray's debut with their marquee free agent being on the mound for the first time in a Cardinals uniform for there to only be 31,000 fans in terms of the tickets sold? There definitely were not that many people in the stadium yesterday i think i think cardinals fans are, are making their thoughts known and they're doing the best way they know how and not spending money on this team they they don't want to put the money out there even if it's something as exciting as sunny gray's debut and again i understand it was kind of so quick to where you didn't have enough time those tickets are on the secondary market for people to go out there we talked about it you could have dropped 15 bucks to go down and see sunny gray's debut Cardinals fans, it just feels like, at least from what we see, from what I hear when I talk to friends, family that are Cardinals fans, they don't want to go out and spend money, take time out of their lives to go watch a brand that isn't putting that same emphasis on making you want to come watch. And for all of the griping and the complaining, there's only one way you can make your thoughts known publicly, and 100%. it's to take money away from the DeWitts. And the Cardinals fans are doing it. And as we've talked about and as we've stated multiple times, I don't blame them. As a fan, I want to spend the money on something that I know wants me there. And it doesn't feel like, at least from a fan's perspective, they feel wanted. I, I think we will get a better sense of this. Of, I, I think right now it is a lot of skepticism is, what, it, of course, what is driving this right now. The Cardinals start to win. I think you're going to see it come back. I, I, that's just what's going to happen. When they start winning, you're going to see the tickets get sold again. I, I think it goes to show that Cardinals fans want to see this team operate differently in the offseason. I, I think that's what it is. I, I, I said this yesterday. There would there had been the snowball effect that the pitching problem that occurred last year was going to happen at some point, and it did. You lose 90 games. And the offseason was spent talking about leadership. We've got to go get veterans that throw innings. And, and look, we'll see if that formula works. I, I'm skeptical of it. I'm still skeptical of it today. If it works and they start winning, then they're going to get the fan base back. Because what's the fan base? What most importantly, they want to see a winning ball club that's out there for the St. Louis Cardinals. I think it shows you that fan the fan base is tired of how the team operates in the offseason. Whether that is some part of the fan base that says they should spend more money or it is the part of the fan base that says, of how they allocate that money that they spend. I think this is a eye-opening statement from the fan base of, hey, you guys talked about changing your model, how you wanted to build a team, and then you really didn't do it. I also think it's worth noting, like, this has not always been the case here in St. Louis. Like, there have been years in which the Cardinals' attendance was down. Like, go back to the 90s. It's been a long time, right? Because you had the Maguire era in the late 90s where people are going out to see him. Um, and he brought baseball back in a meaningful way here in St. Louis. And then, of course, you get to the 2000 and like, OK, now we're off and running. We've got superstars. We're the best organization in the sport. And that basically continued through like 2015. 
And so for that 15-year stretch, they were amazing. And so, yeah, why wouldn't you go down to the ballpark? Great place to watch a game, family environment, like reasonably inexpensive to go down there. Relatively speaking, uh, all entertainment can get expensive. I understand that, and I'm not telling you that you need to go down. But, like, it was a good way to spend a day here in St. Louis to go watch the ball game, and the team was good. So why not? And that wasn't the case at times in the mid-90s. Like you go back to the attendance numbers, man, prior to the 95 uh, sh shortened season, like 94, 95, 2.8, 2.4, 2.4, 2.5 million fans going through the stands. When they weren't good in the early 90s, fans responded by going to fewer games. It is not a birthright for the Cardinals to have 3.2 million fans in the stands every single year. Fans will decide eventually not worth it not worth it for me to go down there anymore man i don't want to do it time like you can come up with a whole lot of explanations excuses whatever you want to call it for why you don't go down to the ballpark it's easier to come up with excuses or explanations to not go than it is to actually alex you know this i certainly have learned this as now a father as well taking a f taking your your little ones to a, a, a situation where you're going to be somewhere doing something for three hours Man, there is a lot of investment beyond the three hours that goes into that. Time and money. <laughs> it's picking the kid up from daycare a little bit early compared to normal. It's getting down to the stadium. It's having the snacks packed ready to go. It's knowing where you go for breastfeeding time or to change a diaper. It's paying for whatever it is that you're getting while you're out there. It's up and down and up and down while you're at the stadium and not really watching this, the game from your seats and going over to the kids' area and all these different things, right? And then getting back home, and then you've got to throw off uh, your nighttime routine compared to normal. Like, it's a lot. So they've got to convince you to go down there. And their play recently hasn't done that. And that's the honest truth. Like, yes, it does absolutely, T-Bone, to your point, show that fans wanted them to be more aggressive, but also fans wanted them to win. They wanted them to win last year. They wanted them to win the year before that. And they don't feel like the team is investing enough, whether that's right or wrong. doesn't much matter. That's their perception. So until that changes, this is going to be the way that it probably goes for a little bit. Yep. They need to see this team be good. I'm the easy one to convince that they're good. Alex and T-Bone speak more for this fan base than I do. Clearly, based on the way that the, the attendance numbers are going right now, I don't think this is a blip anymore. I think this is going to become the trend. And it's going to be more of this for the foreseeable future until the Cardinals convince you, the listening audience, you, the paying consumer, that it's worth your time and worth your investment to go back down to the ballpark because they are good. Yeah. They got to get good for you to go back down. I think that the Cardinals need to show an ability or make an effort to make the common fan feel wanted. I think that is going to be the biggest thing with this team right now. And maybe it's winning. I just, from what these last couple of years and few years have been like, you're going to have to make an effort to make people feel wanted by your actions and your actions are going to be, are you aggressive? Do you see a team that you say we need to build on it? Because that's what it was for the longest time. Why I always felt like I wanted to go to the ballpark was I wanted to say I was at the season because it felt like that team could win the world series. And I was there when they were, went on their world series run. I, I don't know if people really care because I like this team's going to be bad. Why do I want to make an effort for you if you're not making an effort for me i remember so this is going back to my, my kansas city time right 2014 the royals uh, it was the first time they had been good in a while 2013 they were okay they won 86 games whatever like, people got to remember that the, the royals were bleeping terrible my entire upbringing like freaking horrible so it's easy for me to watch this right now and be like hey look at the young players i know this <laughs> i recognize I this the yes. because, like, oh, you guys complain about thirty-two thousand. this is awesome <laughs> there was twelve thousand um, when so i went like, hey man this is my wheelhouse so growing up like i would go down to the royals games for like 10 bucks dude it was amazing i'd be off on the summer i'm 16 17 years old and i've got an opportunity to go down there and like see a, a terrible team at a pretty fun ballpark and like sit down the third baseline five rows up for 10 bucks and then i could get down down to like literally next to the dugout by the end of the game because nobody else is there so it's great good time 2014 comes around the team's pretty good they, they're kind of in it at the at the deadline they don't really do anything though and like down the stretch of that season it was still like the same attendance that they were getting the years prior and the manager ned yost came out and was like where are the fans why aren't you coming out to watch the club and the fans were like man because we don't believe in you like, we don't believe in this team. And eventually, they proved that they were worthy. They went to the World Series that year. In the next year, it was a trickle-down effect. The following season, they brought in 2.7 million fans. The last time that they had gotten more than 2 million fans in the stands in Kansas City was 1991. And then they did it in 2015. 
but it was a hangover effect from the 2014 season that didn't show up until 2015. What we're seeing right now is the opposite. In St. Louis, you're seeing the hangover effect from the worst season that the Cardinals have had in 20 years, 30 yeah. years. My, my dad did this with, with Blues. He was a season ticket holder for the longest time, and then post-lockout when they traded away Chris Pronger, my dad was like, why? Why, why should I renew my tickets for you basically saying we stink and we're going to stink? And he didn't renew them until the year that they won – or uh, got into the playoffs that 08 09 season and then he renewed him so for three years he was like you're not making an effort why should i spend my money on that and i don't know if you guys feel this way i i'm starting to feel this way and the way that they've started the season starts to add to this there is no superstar to go watch on the cardinals there's a lot of really good players there are like some great great pitcher i wouldn't call him a superstar you know paul goldschmidt nolan arno and i mentioned the slow stars because i think those guys are great players i'm not sure they're superstars anymore Th this team doesn't have that superstar and you'd go well tanner goldschmidt won mvp in 2022 you went to the ballpark for albert you went to the ballpark for Albert's Correct. chase for 700. That's exactly you, why I went to the ballpark. The MVP is going to get forgotten about for Paul Goldschmidt. And a lot of fans find Goldschmidt and Arnado frustrating because they haven't performed in the playoffs. And I would still say, hey, small sample size, but that's what they're being remembered for. You know, a lot of what I see on our text line and when we did mic drops yesterday, it was this offense, this offense. Well, if you're talking about the offense, you're not talking about it as a whole. You're talking about Goldie and Arnado. There is no superstar to go watch. Think back to the 90s teams that were bad. They had Mark McGuire, a superstar that was in the home run chase. Then you have Albert Pujols. And then it kind of fades away, but you still have Matt Holiday and the team's winning and they're winning as a group. And then you have the one bad season. And I can look at this team now and I can tell you, there's just no superstar. There's a lot of great players. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that you guys want to hear the national perspective on the uh, tyler o'neill trade that's starting to take place now oh good yes great let's hear from brian kenny for a team we were just talking about the orioles being good at identifying talent aren't the cardinals supposed to be good at that like the like uh, identifying drafting developing it's it's strange they were that they're trading these guys away who become major stars i don't get it there seems to be friction there's things they don't like about players and again that's great when you have 15 straight winning years, which they did until last year. It's a little harder now when you're not winning. They lost 91 games last year. So, like, they can do the cardinal way and say, you're not playing our way and we'll punish you. But you got to be able to assess talent or at least be able to inspire the guys that you're having problems with instead of benching them and alienating them. I, I, I think Brian is spot on right now which uh, of course i'm the one saying this i, I think the cardinals have a, a, a problem right now in in keeping certain players not happy but like you're getting them to develop the way with the cardinals and you're seeing them go elsewhere and have success i, I just thought of this when i was listening to brian you know who they kind of starting to remind me of the buffalo sabers and of course i'm, I'm relating to this hockey but jack eichel ryan o'reilly um, who's the other guy that they just traded away? But they've, they they traded away, or Taylor Hall was one of them. They trade away guys that aren't having success, and they're like, what is going on right now? Why is this guy not good? You're underperforming. And they trade him away, and those players get the sigh of relief where it's like, <sighs> and they go on and have success elsewhere. I, I'm starting to wonder if the Cardinals are falling into that. I mean, if we want to do that for Randy Rosarena, fine. We are not doing this for Tyler O'Neill. What are you talking We're about? We're not man? doing MVP. It. Every uh, unanimously, every single one of us said, got to trade him. I would have just non tendered him. <laughs> like, it was over, man. He can't stay healthy. He wasn't particularly good when he was healthy. By OPS Plus, he had a one season since 2019 in which he was above league average as a hitter, and it was the one year that we all knew, hot damn, that guy's amazing. Let's give him a contract extension. And, wow. of course, that would have been a disaster as well. Yeah, 10, by 10, 10, 10 by 100, ladies and gentlemen. This was the most obvious move that John Mosaloc has had to make in his entire tenure. The dude was bent, or he, they pinch hit for him in a playoff series. He was benched last year for a lack of effort, and it was earned, by the way. And he wouldn't, he refused to play on turf later in that same season when he was benched for a lack of effort. If you want to talk about Randy Rosarena and that trade, you want to talk about how they, they didn't ever give the opportunity for, to Jordan Hicks that Dolis he Garcia. probably should have had. That one I'm also rejecting. Marcelo Zuna right now. Every team in Major League Baseball could have had Adolis Garcia, and they chose not to because he wasn't good at that point in time. He is a, a credit to him, man. It's worked. This is not the one I'm willing to listen to. Jordan Hicks, sure, we can talk about that. If Jack Flaherty has bounced back this year, sure, we can talk about that. Tyler O'Neill. 
At what, really? at what point do you start talking about it about with Tyler? Tyler? Never. Yeah. Never. It was the right move. Yeah. And I'm not even going to talk about it with Jack, to be honest with you. I, I think you mentioned Buffalo. I think the issue with the Sabres was that was a bad environment that could never develop talent. I think O'Neill and Flaherty were cancers in that locker room last year. And I think if that's the case, Ali Marmol said at the end of last season, we got to get guys that don't really care to be Cardinals out of this locker room. And the Cardinals did that. I will not crush them for O'Neill, and I will not crush them for Jack Flaherty if Jack has success in Detroit. Somebody said, we didn't get major league talent for Tyler O'Neill, though. Robertson sucks in AAA. Yeah, they could have got a bag of balls, and I would have said, good work. Like, it was it was over. It was so over for Tyler O'Neill and his tenure here in St. Louis. It was time for that relationship to end. And sometimes things just run their course, man. Like, there will come a point in time, Alex, why where you, I was just going to say, why the hell did he just look at me? <laughs> it's course. Maybe that day is today. Coming up next are the Blues speaking with their action, speaking of running its course, with Kevin Hayes being Whoa. once again in the press box. We'll Whoa. talk about it next. BK, I won a bet last night thanks to my friends over no at Circa Sports Illinois. I know I seem like I suck at this, but I promise I did this. It was my parlay last night. I did a hockey one. I, t- I took the Capitals winning straight up on the money line, and I also took the Ducks plus one and a half. Nailed it, and I won myself $350. And guess what, BK? If I would have made that same bet, because I checked on other apps, if I would have made that same bet on DraftKings last night, I only would have won $200. This is why we bet over on the the Circa Sports app in Illinois. They're the biggest sports book in Las Vegas, and now you can get them at your fingertips in the state of Illinois. Go download the app today. Be sure to do so ahead of the Masters because you're going to be betting over oh, there yeah. for the Masters. It's coming up. Maybe you won John Rom. That's my personal favorite uh, bet to place on this one. He's plus 1,300. 13 to win. 13 to 1. You bet $100, you win $1,300 over at Circa. Yes. If you made the exact same bet, on FanDuel or DraftKings, you're only winning $1,100. They're giving you better odds over on the Circa Sports app. Don't believe me? Go check it out yourself. Download the app today. Circa Sports app is the place to be betting. 1-800-G- uh, 1-800-GAMBLER or text ILGAMB to 833-234 if you or someone you know has a gambling problem.
All right, so Kevin Hayes. Let's talk about this, Alex. What happened? He was Blue's the, he was the locker room guy. Tonight. They traded for him. They're like, ah, locker Blue's room guy. Blackhawks. Pre-game starting at 6 o'clock right here in your home of the Blues, 101 ESPN. By the way, you can't lose to them tonight because if you do, the, the two teams clinch and you're eliminated. So don't lose I mean, to the Blackhawks. They're, they're eliminated anyway. No, they're not, man. They're only five point or four points away. Yeah, mathematically, they're not eliminated. The Pegas cold tonight just lost. Line up tonight, according to the morning skate, you got Bull Duke on that top line once again with Thomas and Chin. I love that they're doing that. I think it's super smart. Saad with Buchnevich. Kyrie still don't understand the whole idea of having Buchnevich at center, but whatever. Run its course, baby. Torpchenko with Dean and Kapanen. All right, Dean top nine. And on the fourth line, you got Walker, Alexandrov, and Blay. The guy that I did not say there was Kevin Hayes, who is going to be an extra tonight. And then when it comes to your defensive core, you've got Perutovic playing with Pareko, Krug and Kessel, Letty, and Tucker. Scandella is your extra. Alex, I find two things with the lineup going into tonight to be particularly interesting. Perunovic playing with Pareko. Back-to-back games, by the way. And Hayes once again being an extra sitting up in the press box. That's the one that surprises the hell out of me. What do you make of Kevin Hayes once again being a healthy scratch for the Blues at this Ob- point in the year? Obviously, they're not pleased with his play. Uh, because I, look, I, I, I think we know a lot of these players, but like Hayes is under contract next season. Hayes is a guy that is going to be here. Maybe you're playing, you're playing Kapanen who has not been good. Still think he hasn't scored a goal since like December. You're playing Blay who they sat for like 30 straight games over Kevin Hayes. Both of those guys that I just named, by the way, are unrestricted free agents that I think we can all agree aren't going to be here beyond the season. And you're sitting Kevin Hayes. And by the way, this is the second of the last three games that Kevin Hayes has been a healthy scratch. He was set against San Jose, and they played Kapanen, Alexandrov, and Dean, who, look, I advocate for putting Dean in, and especially in the top nine role. But, man, playing Hayes, or playing Kapanen and play over Kevin Hayes, I think that tells you a lot of where the Blues are. I think their response, Alex, would be, we know what Kevin Hayes is. We want to find out more about the young guys. But I, Kapanen and Blay aren't the young guys, though. And that's what my retort would be. The way that you get Kevin Hayes into the lineup is by putting Dean up into your top six as a center, moving Booch back over to the wing, and now you can put Hayes in that third-line role and pull Kapanen out of the lineup. Or even if you don't want to, keep Dean at the center position and put Hayes on the wing. They were putting Hayes on the wing sure. with Braden Shen. But I like if if that is if they say, hey, we we just want Kevin Hayes to be out there. If he's going to be at center, we don't feel like he needs to necessarily. We don't we don't need to learn anything about him. Cool. That's that's how you do it. Like it, it's it's yeah. not hard to accomplish. You just pull Ke- Kapanen out. Kapanen has no future here in St. Louis, man. Agreed. And I think you say the same for Blay. Agreed. But it like maybe they view Blay as somebody that they could bring back on Extra. a one year like minimum level contract and yeah. whatever. That's fine. I, I got no problems. He brings with that. a physical presence to his game. Sure. Cool. Kapanen has no future, no matter what, here in St. Louis. Hayes might, and. At this point in the year, is there value in finding out what he can do? No, maybe not. But I do think it's telling that he's not going to be on the ice. Yeah. So, somebody, somebody, sorry, BK, somebody texted in and said, Hayes could be nursing an injury. You guys don't know. Well, he could be. Everybody's injured at this point. But D, uh, Bannister was asked prior to the Ducks game if Hayes was dealing with something. And Bannister said, no, he's fine. So Bannister told you that he was healthy for the Sharks game. He played in the Ducks game. And now he's sitting again. And he only played like 11, 12 minutes, I think, in that Ducks game. I think the Blues are trading Kevin Hayes in the offseason. That's pure speculation. I don't know how. You retain 50% of his salary. You make him a $1.75 million player for somebody else, and you trade him for like a mid-round pick. Maybe. I think that's what you do. I I think at $1.7 million as a fourth-line center, he has value for somebody. I just don't think that there's real value for him here any longer um, because Dean should be in that spot next year. Dean should be your third-line center and you operate accordingly. Yep. Uh, that That's the way that I would like to see them go. It's and surprising. I do think it is telling that he is not in the lineup. But one other thing, Alex, is Perunovic with Pareko. Mm-hmm. Do you make anything of this? Or just like, hey, we got a few games to play with here. Why not? I think they're doing the same thing with him that they're doing with Perunovic and era uh, with uh, Bolduc and Dean. I think they're saying like, okay, we, earn, we own his rights. Is he a blue or is he not a blue? Because if he's not, well, then let's play him up here. Let's see what he looks like. And if he stays healthy, maybe we can move him. But if he is playing well with Pareko, now we need to figure out what we can do with him as a restricted free agent. I thought his two best games were played these last two games when he was playing with Colton Pareko. So 
it, it, it seems like they've got the opportunity with Falk not playing the rest of the way. I don't expect them to try and get Marco Scandella back into the lineup. They keep Perunovic up there and say, we gave you every opportunity to be an NHL regular this season. You didn't live up to it. Now we're putting you with Pareko. Let's see how you live up to it. He's Alex. That's T-Bone on BK Blues in action tonight. Alex will have your pregame coverage starting at 6 o'clock again right here on your home of the Blues 101 ESPN. Chris Kerber will be on the call for that game tonight, and he joins us next here on 101 ESPN. Listen, nobody wants to buy an HVAC system. We all know that. And they also know that you really don't want to have the call for repairs. So there's two things you can do. Number one, do your best to maintain your HVAC system with classic air care. Let them come in. Let them do the normal service checks. Let them make sure that everything is getting ready to be up and running for the summer air conditioning needs for your house. The other thing is we do know that repairs do happen. And when they do, you need help and you need someone you can trust. You know that Alex Ferrario's family has used Classic Air Care for a long time as well. They've got a 4.8 Rudy, uh, rating on Google, and they have been making comfortable since 1926. They stand behind their work. You know that they will come in, take care of your needs when you need them. They know nobody loves that moment. They know how to handle it. They make it easy on you, and they get the work done, and they get it done right. It's Classic Air Care. Book an appointment today at ClassicAirCare.com.
Terry Henderson here with a Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling. The Cardinals are currently tanking on the Philadelphia Phillies in the rain as they are tied at two apiece in the top of the fifth inning. Lance Lynn's on the mound for St. Louis. Aaron Nola got the start for the Philadelphia Phillies. And the Blues will be back in action tonight as they take on the Chicago Blackhawks. We'll have pregame coverage starting at 6 o'clock with Alex Ferrario and Joey Vitale. Then Joey will join Chris Gerber for puck drop at 7. And the voice of the Blues, Chris Gerber, joins us next here on BK and Ferrario. This sports update was brought to you by so Liga. Heating and cooling, an independent American standard heating and air conditioning dealer. With Alex Ferrario and Tanner Hendrickson, I'm Brandon Kylie. You've got BK and Ferrario here on 101 ESPN. Happy to go out to the 101 ESPN hotline right now to be joined by Chris Kerber. He's the voice of the Blues. You'll hear him tonight on the call for Blues versus Blackhawks. Pre-game coverage starting right here at 6 o'clock. Curbs, appreciate the time as always, man. Let's get right into the conversation. I want to bring you in on something that we were just talking about in the last segment, which is uh, the decisions that they're making right now in terms of who the healthy scratches are down the stretch this year. Uh, how much do you read into it, if at all, that they decided to healthy scratch Kevin Hayes once again tonight? Uh, boy, that's a good question. How much do I read into it? I don't know that I read anything into it other than it's been some pretty consistent coaching there from uh, from Drew Bannister. I mean, we have seen him uh, sit rookies. We've seen him sit your highest paid players. We've seen him sit um, grizzled veteran type players. And I think the one thing that Drew Bannister has definitely shown in that process is it doesn't matter your age, your experience, whatever. He has expectations, and uh, he expects them to be met. Now, that's the analysis, BK, from the outside looking in. I do not know and haven't been privy to any other kind of conversations that would include, you know, discussions with uh, Blues General Manager Doug Armstrong of certain things he wants to see or opportunities for other guys. So, is there any more to it than simply play-based? That I don't know, um, you know. But I, I, I do see consistency and accountability that we've seen from this uh, head coach since he took over. On the Scott Perunovich side, curves because this is the second straight game where he'll be playing with Colton Pareko. In the last two, he played north of 20 minutes, uh, which is the most he's played in his career. Do you think that the Blues still feel like the jury's still out on Perunovich to find out who he is, or are they do they know who he is? And it's just a matter of let's give him this opportunity so we can say we saw it on every aspect. No, I think when you've played as few games as he has, uh, which is less than 100 in his career. Uh, I, I think it's safe to say, Alex, that the jury is still out. Um, having said that, you know, when you look at you look at Falk going down and, and and Tucker being in the lineup and Kessel being in the lineup and Perunovic being in the lineup, I, I think you just see a little bit of a safety net of a head coach by making sure that at any one given time you've got a veteran player with each one, with each one of those uh, rookies or you know second year guys. So you know from that aspect of things. You know, the other thing I've learned, too, all these years is you could look at those pairings, and, and they may stick throughout the whole game. Uh, who knows? But situationally, I, I still, you know, might expect to see Letty and Pareko out there at different times depending on what's up because, look, uh, I, I know mathematically it's still a challenge. Uh, you're going to need a whole heck of a lot of hope. Vegas has already lost two in a row. I, you know, you don't see them losing seven in a row to lose this to end the season. Uh, having said that, the Blues are still in a spot where their playoff lives are still intact and still alive, and the Blues will have to coach and play accordingly. Chris Gerber is our guest here on 101 ESPN, voice of the Blues. He joins us each and every Wednesday on BK and Ferrario. Uh, Curbs, I don't know how much research, if any, you've done into this, but we were talking a little bit off air about the idea of Jordan Bennington being in the Vezina Trophy conversation. Where do you think you would have him among the top contenders for such an honor this year? Oh, I don't think he's going to uh, knock on the door of, of a finalist spot. Uh, I, I think there, he, he could see some votes, you know, here or there. Um, 
you know, but as much as that is uh, an individual award for a goaltender, it, it is also a, you know, the, the team has to play a, a role in it. And so I, I don't think his numbers are going to be good enough, uh, you know, to, to get him there. And look, do I think they've gotten enough goaltending and good enough goaltending from Jordan Bennington to have had different results and be a playoff team? I absolutely do think they do. I have said this unabashedly and, and stick with this, that there's only one, maybe two or three goaltenders I might consider to take over Jordan Bennington if I need to win a game seven. And that's because we've had the privilege of watching him for the last five years, you know, but in terms of, you know, him getting real Vesna consideration, he might get some votes here or there, but I, I don't think it's going to be anything that, uh, um, well, I'd be surprised if it's anything that really jumps off the page at you, I guess. So with with that being said, Curves, uh, I was listening to the Thirty Two Thoughts podcast. I'm not sure if you caught it at all, but Elliot Friedman was talking. Yeah. To, uh, he was talking about the Blues, and he was talking about how tough of a season it was, and said that he feels like Doug Armstrong is going to want to do massive surgery on this roster. He brought up the idea of trading Jordan Bennington. Well, he's not the only one that's brought that idea up. I'm sure. Uh, y- you know when look. You will, when you look around the league and you look at teams that are looking for goaltending and you look at where some of these other teams could have been had they had goaltending, is there a market for a good goaltender, whether it be him or UC Soros or whatever? Remember, it wasn't all that long ago UC Soros' name was getting bantered around, wasn't it? Yeah. Right? So at least in, in the rumor mill. Okay. So, you know, you look at that. I, I'm going to stick and I'm going to stay consistent on this, at least from a my opinion standpoint. The Blues have the one thing you need to continue to stay competitive during a turnaround process, and that is the goaltending. The goaltending has prevented teams like Philadelphia, like New Jersey, from doing other stuff. The goaltending remains a question mark for some teams going into the playoffs, like the Edmonton Oilers, you know, and 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 some others. There are so the Blues have the one thing you need philosophically do they decide that they could get a haul for him that could help turn things around because they're fairly confident with Joel Hofer? Yes. But you have no confidence yet that Joel Hofer can carry the mail. You've seen how the Blues have had to work this in terms of a 1A, 1B situation, you know, and, and it's worked for the St. Louis Blues. So the, I have to stay consistent on my philosophy. Could they trade him? Sure. I think the Blues could trade anybody. But do they have the one commodity that you need to turn things around and where you can go from missing the playoffs to contending for a division? Yeah, they got that one thing, and that's your goaltender. So I'm real leery of those kind of things. Because, guys, we've seen this in St. Louis. We went for a long time, a long time, without having a bona fide, real good number one goaltender. And when you got it, I'm not willing just to let that go. Curbs, the other thing, like as a, as a follow-up on that, Goalie trades are just so incredibly rare in the NHL. It's something that has never really made total sense to me. Like, you almost never see it at the trade deadline. And then in the offseason, even, when they do happen, it doesn't end up garnering as much in return as as I think most fans would typically expect. And so if you're going to trade a guy like Jordan Bennington, man, you better be getting a massive haul in return right now. And for whatever reason... Teams just don't value goalies in terms of the trade market for uh, for those guys the way that I would typically expect. So I I just I don't know that the Blues would be able to get enough in return to make it worth their while, even if they did want to or, or were open to exploring that opportunity. Listen, I, I think it's a it's a great point, Brandon, because again, yes, it, it is going to de- depend on the return. Do you value the return, and are you better both now and in the future? You know, with that. You have a situation from a cap standpoint with the salary cap finally about to go up for the first time in five years away from that flat cap that is really, that's what, guys, that as much as anything is what really prevented the Blues from continuing to maintain some of the the, the, the salaries and things that they needed to after winning that cup. And the situation with the goaltending is with Joel Hofer under contract for another year at a, basically an extremely cheap rate. And with Jordan Bennington at just six or six and a half, whatever it is, when you've got the goaltending tandem that the Blues have, right, at, at, at seven million, seven and a half million, 
you you have a great number there for two goaltenders, and I, and none of your other goalies in the organization are ready to make the step up. So if you move him, you've got to go out and find another one. Well, look at what's happened when the Blues have tried to go out and find the backups. Thomas Grice, you know, Johnson, uh, other guys that have come in, and, and eventually it, even even those backups just haven't worked. So, if look, guys, if there's one situation, if there's one spot in this organization that you do not need to look at for a while, it's your goaltending. And that, that, frankly, that might be the biggest comfort of anything. You can go find forwards. You can go find defensemen. I don't believe you can just go find goaltending. And there are other teams around the league absolutely proving that. So the way I look at it, if there's one aspect of this team that isn't broken, it's your doggone goalies. He's Chris Kerber, voice of the Blues. You'll hear him on the call tonight. Blues versus the Blackhawks. Alex has pregame coverage starting right here on your home of the Blues, 101 ESPN at 6 o'clock. Kerbs, always enjoy getting your perspective on this team. Only one week left here in the season to be able to do so, and then we'll wrap things up with you. Looking forward to that. Hey, maybe they get into the playoffs when we continue these conversations into the postseason. Appreciate the time as always, man. We'll talk with you again next week. All right, guys. Have an awesome rest of your week. So you got it. It's Chris Kerber, voice of the blues here on 101 ESPN. We'll hit the rewind coming up next here on 101 ESPN.
If you missed anything from today's show, be sure to check it out on the podcast page, 101ESPN.com, and the free 101 ESPN app is where you go to find it. It's all presented by Dobbs Tire and Auto Center. You guys can always check us out on YouTube as well, youtube.com slash 101ESPNSTL. And coming up on Friday morning from 7 to 10 o'clock, you can go see the opening drive at the Rawlings, Rawlings Experience at the Westport Plaza. Rawlings is opening up that Rawlings experience right here in St. Louis, and the opening drive is going to be there on Friday for the grand opening. Get all the details at 101ESPN.com. All right, a couple of things to get to. First, another really solid start out of Lance Lynn today. Went five innings. Looks like he's probably going to be replaced in the sixth. They've got Andre Pallante uh, warming. He threw 94 pitches, so it makes sense this is the end for him. Did not allow an earned run in the game. Finished with six strikeouts and allowed just one hit despite the elements that were very clearly working against him. And if you're saying, BK, how about those excuse strain? I mean, Aaron Nola was on the other side and Lance Lynn outpitched him today. Like Lance Lynn was the better pitcher on the mound out of him and Aaron Nola. So credit where it's due. Lance Lynn really good. Somebody tweeted this, by the way, Alex. Um, Lance Lynn has a real chance to be third all time in franchise history at the end of the season in strikeouts by a cardinal starter while here in st louis that's crazy i can't believe that he's going to be that high on the list potentially so that's the lance Lynn side of things i wanted to get your reaction to the nhl news that just came out a little bit ago alex according to frank saravalli the nhl the arizona coyotes and the ownership group have made significant progress on the framework of an agreement to relocate the coyotes to salt lake city you surprised by this at all not really. I, I mean, I know Gary Bettman tried to push back on that and the Winnipeg Jets thing as much as possible, but this has been an ongoing soap opera for, man, it feels like the last four years of Arizona trying to get this land figured out, and then they go play at a college arena. I, I think because the Arizona had sent it to where it was going to get approved for land to build a stadium, it just feels an awful lot like the NHL basically saying, look, we've done this rodeo multiple times. We've got a place that's willing to bring a team here now, has everything to support it, and an ownership group that's on board. They got the stadium. We're going down this path. It, it, it surprises me because I thought they were going to find a way to get it done, but it doesn't surprise me that the NHL is like, no, we're done with this rodeo. Yeah, I'm not too surprised by it because it felt like they were going to get to a point where they had to relocate because I know they released a statement uh, a couple of weeks ago about, you know, there's this piece of land. Here's our idea. We will not lose this bidding war for this land. I, I thought that was the last ditch effort for them to try and stay in Arizona, but it's clear that they've now decided to abandon ship on that and just relocate. And I, I it makes they had to figure out Arizona. They yeah. cannot continue to play in a college arena. Yeah, you need I, more revenue. They're right now where the Oakland A's will very likely be two years from now because I don't think Las Vegas is happening I do not think that the Oakland A's will play baseball games in Las Vegas I'm highly skeptical I think Vegas gets a team I don't think it's the A's I think Vegas will eventually have their own team that is an expansion team and when that takes place it'll probably be Las Vegas and Nashville that get those teams I don't know where the A's are eventually going I don't think they're long-term going to be in Oakland. I don't think they're long-term going to be in Sacramento. I don't know what happens to that franchise, but it feels very similar to what has happened over the past couple of seasons in Arizona. They're going to move to Sacramento, playing in this 10,000-seat stadium, very similarly to uh, the Coyotes playing in Mullet Arena. Eventually, that just becomes untenable, man. It's not an NHL atmosphere. As much as people try to sell you on it, no. Going there does not feel like playing against other NHL teams. There's no way for it to. So eventually you got to find a new home i feel bad for the people in arizona hockey just for whatever reason it didn't work maybe it will next time if they decide to go back there but it didn't work this time around and i do think it could work in salt lake city they clearly have the infrastructure the interest they want a hockey team to be there so kudos to them for stepping up when it seems like nobody else really wanted to We'll see if it works. I think it's it gonna could be, happen as soon as next year. It sounds yeah, like. well, and I think it's going to be good on that side because you've already kind of got that that West Coast style, or style rivalry building. you got Seattle and Vancouver. I think it could be good for them to move a little bit over, have their proper ownership with the stadium, and you're going to have money to spend, and it's not going to be this rebuild. They've already got a good team in place and a guy running it, so I think it's going to be smart by them. He's Alex. That's T-Bone. I'm BK. you got BK and Ferrario. We'll be back tomorrow at 11 a.m. The Fastlane's coming up next from 2 to 6 right here on 101 ESPN. Turner Spoich.